Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the subject of electricity market development and the transition to a multi-market model, covering the urgency and also the implications. My name is Chris Yelland, and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. Um, a big welcome also to our presenters, who will be introduced to you in due course. And a big welcome, of course, to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. This webinar is co-hosted by EE Business Intelligence and the Power Futures Lab at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Rand Merchant Bank, Weber Wenzel, Enerweb, the South African Independent Power Producers Association, Get.Transform, the South African German Energy Program, and GIZ for their most valuable support in putting this webinar together and for the great work that they do in this field. About 1,800 delegates have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter covered and the stature of the presenters themselves. So may I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put your hands up to ask questions verbally. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, with the legal separation of ESCOM's generation, transmission, and distribution businesses, and the high growth rate of private sector participation in the Southern African economy and in the South African electricity supply industry through IPPs and traders, an informal competitive market has already begun to emerge. Bilateral IPP to customer wheeling arrangements, over-the-counter electricity trading, and third-party electricity trading between uh, parties involving multiple generators and off-takers is taking shape. As the processing time of trading license by NERSA reduces, this trend will continue, subject also to the technical challenges of gaining access to the grid. As the volumes of wheeling-based energy continue to increase and become more significant in ESCOM's overall generation mix, further changes are likely to be necessary. The Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill provides the legal and regulatory framework for the establishment of a multi-market model, giving IPPs access to a competitive electricity generation market as this is introduced. So this webinar will focus on the urgency and implications of the transition to a multi-market model to serve the changing needs of the electricity supply industry in the Southern African region. Professor Anton Eberhardt will open the webinar with a few insights on the subject and the urgency for market reform. Hans Arolt Brielsen of Brielsen Consulting will speak on international experiences and perspectives. And then Keith Bowen of Eskom will speak on local and Eskom perspectives. Jason van der Poel of Weber Wenzel will then speak on the legal issues and Dr. Gerard van Harmelen of M. Enerweb will speak on the IT and technical issues. Finally, uh, Dario Musso of Rand Merchant Bank will speak on the financial issues, and he'll summarize and wrap up with some insights on the presentations. And then, after all of this, Christine Juta of the Power Futures Lab at the UCT Graduate School of Business will moderate a 30 minute QA session. So, may I now introduce you to Anton Eberhard, Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at the Power Futures Lab of UCT's Graduate School of Business. Anton's research, teaching, and advisory work 
focuses on governance and regulatory incentives to improve utility performance, power investment challenges, the design of new power markets, renewable energy, and distributed energy resources. Anton has worked in the energy sector across Sub-Saharan Africa and other developing regions for more than 40 years and was the founding director of the Energy and Development Research Center. He has served on the National Planning Commission and the Board of NERSA and has been a driving force for the production of this webinar. Anton, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris, for that introduction. And uh, as co-host on behalf of the Power Futures Lab at the University of Cape Town, uh, may I also welcome you all to this webinar, a webinar on uh, trying to explain how the electricity market might evolve uh, in, in South Africa. So let me also offer just some introductory remarks. So after 100 years of ESCOM, which is still state-owned, still vertically integrated, still the dominant utility, we are on the cusp of a fundamental transformation of South Africa's power system and, and market. The decision to unbundle uh, transmission from ESCOM has now been finally made and, and is being implemented years after uh, the first suggestion that this should be the case, the 1998 Energy Policy White Paper, which said we should separate um, transmission. When I chaired President Ramaphosa's ESCOM Sustainability Task Team in the late 2018 and 2019, we resurrected those proposals. The president accepted the recommendation that ESCOM should be unbundled, and he announced uh, that that year in, in Parliament. So every effort now is being made to uh, implement and to pass the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill, which makes provision for the establishment of a transmission system operator, uh, a TSO, which will include four functions, basically, the operation and, and ownership of the transmission system, one, two, the system operator, three, the market operator, and uh, fourth, a central uh, purchasing agency. And the national transmission company, which has been uh, incorporated as a subsidiary of ESCOM Holdings, will be this interim uh, a facility taking on the roles of the TSO. But the Act says that the TSO should be established as a separate entity uh, within five years. So South Africa's electricity industry will, will never be the same again. The T TSO will create a fair and, and transparent platform for the contracting and trading of electricity, and it will insulate that from ESCOM's generation interest. In, in, indeed, it will remove that conflict of interest where ESCOM is both a generator and owner and operator of the monopoly transmission grid. So private sector participation in generation will be assured and competition will, will be enhanced. And the sector will move inexorably into this new sustainable future. But I think what's been unusual about the South African reform process is that there's been no central restructuring czar, no reform team that is leading the process, no clear end vision, no strategy uh, to get there. Instead, this has been a kind of incremental thing that has developed organically, uh, like the need to uh, uh, have more generation capacity on the system. And so we see these incremental changes, the lifting of the requirement for a license, for example, this incremental implementation of reform. But now we're going through a huge step uh, to complement this market that, that Chris uh, mentioned that has developed the bilateral market, contracts between IPPs and, and users, wheeling. We now will have the TSO and the market operator setting up a whole range of new trading platforms. Uh, and I think really important choices will need to be made uh, over the next while. And let me just go through this list because I think there's been insufficient discussion around, around these choices. For example, will we go the re European power market route uh, where we see net markets with multiple decentralized and voluntary power exchanges with self-dispatch? Or will we rather go the North American or South American style mandatory gross power pool with central control and dispatch? Will we have nodal or zonal or national pricing 
Will we have a day ahead market and also intraday markets and a balancing market? And what about capacity? Will there be energy as well as capacity markets or auctions to secure capacity and reserves, as well as auxiliary services for frequency and voltage support, reactive power inertia, et cetera? And how will capacity and services be remunerated? How will balance responsibility be assigned? What will be the obligations there? What happens to the existing physical bilateral contracts between IPPs and customers? Will they be exposed to the true costs of balancing reserves and auxiliary services? What about the legacy PPAs between ESCOM and private peakers and the renewable energy IPPs that have been procured in the REAP program? Will these be grandfathered into the CPA, the central purchasing agency through vesting contracts? And how will we deal with ESCOM's generation uh, and its market dominance? How will ESCOM generators participate in these new trading platforms and mechanisms? Should there be vesting contracts with individual uh, generators in ESCOM with PPAs to the CPA? Uh, will they be progressively exposed uh, to, to market prices? What about financial hedging, contracts for differences, futures markets? And I think most critical of all is how do we ensure that we don't have massive price increases as we migrate to full wholesale competition at a time when we have scarcity in generation capacity. I think fortunately we are not facing these questions and challenges blind. We have extensive international experience to draw from. And after that 1998 energy policy white paper, a great deal of work was done here in South Africa and within ESCOM itself. Uh, not many know that ESCOM actually set up an internal generation market within the organization where individual generators in ESCOM were, were bidding prices in uh, to an internal market. And at that time, there was a whole army of consultants that were beginning to design what, what the power uh, exchange and power market uh, would look like. Unfortunately, that was canned by Minister Alec Irwin and President Mbeki in 2004. ESCOM was told to build uh, new coal power stations, uh, and we all know what the result of, of that was. But now, uh, after 20 years, that work has been dusted off, uh, and with the uh, support of consultants, both for ESCOM uh, and National Treasury has also been uh, engaging consultants, they begin to start looking again at international experience, what's been learned, and to start going through those kinds of issues that I've just raised, the kind of choices uh, that we'll be making. So I'm very pleased that in our first two presentations today, uh, we will have some sense of, of some of that work that is being done. Hans Arald uh, Bredesen, uh, consultant, he's been uh, supporting some of the work within ESCOM and, and, and other institutions in South Africa, will outline these broad experiences internationally, the differences in, 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 in these power markets in, in, in different regions. And Keith Bowen, who's been leading very much the work on market development within ESCOM, will uh, describe some of their work. I think one, one of the issues that is, is likely to be raised in this webinar is, well, what's the next step? If this bill gets through, we, the TSO is established, the TSO talks about uh, constructing a market code, and this is going to be absolutely central to the, the future of this market because it will embody the detail. The ERA lays out at a very high level the, the key institutions and elements of this market, but it's the market code that will define these choices uh, that, 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 that we make. And I think the next absolutely critical step here is, is how do we get proper stakeholder engagement around this. Uh, not many will know that uh, ESCOM uh, has already drafted a market code. Uh, I'm sure Keith will, will, will reference that to some extent. But I think what we'll see soon, and I think probably under the auspices and governance of the National Electricity Crisis Committee, is a work stream uh, that brings uh, industry stakeholders together now to begin to refine and to finalize the, the, that code. So big, big changes ahead, huge changes. I think what we're trying to do in this webinar is to increase awareness and knowledge 
uh, and understanding amongst ESI participants. Uh, there will obviously be the need for more specialized workshops. And I think we'll see a managed process. Um, as I said, perhaps under, under, under NECOM, the regulator will obviously have to be involved because the market code will have to be approved by the regulator. But there will be these series of workshops where we will pursue in much more detail the kinds of issues that will be surfaced today in this webinar. So again, welcome uh, everyone. Delighted to see uh, so many people uh, that have dialed in and back to you, Chris. Well, thank you very, oops, sorry. Thank you very much, um, Anton. And it's been an honor and a pleasure to co-host this webinar uh, with the uh, Power Futures Lab. And uh, thanks for your introductory words, uh, you know, as we move into the meat and the substance of this webinar. And uh, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you our first uh, presenter, and that is uh, Hans Arold Bredesen of Bredesen Consulting. Uh, Hans Arold was involved in developing the first market systems at Nordpool and has since had over 25 years of international experience in the design and implementation of power markets and trading arrangements as well as in the developing of new product offerings in an involving electricity markets. He's ha he has developed detailed national and regional power market strategies for regulators, power exchanges, and system operators in more than 20 countries and regions worldwide. Hans Arold is the CEO of Bredesen Consulting and is an associate of Nordpool Consulting, where he was recently the CEO. He is a board member of NODES, N-O-D-E-S, the European Marketplace for Trading and Local Flexibility, as well as the International Center for Hydropower. So uh, uh, Hans Arold is a, a consultant of great stature. He has been deeply involved uh, in the South African uh, sector. He's uh, dialing in from Johannesburg today, and it's great pleasure for me now to hand over to Hans Arold for his presentation. Thank you. Hans Arold, if you can turn on your mic. Hans Arold, we're not hearing you. Uh, can you just check that your mic is on? Okay, so it looks like there is a problem at the moment uh, with Hans Arold's uh, microphone uh, and we're not able to hear him. I'm gonna just give one last opportunity Hans Arold, uh, are you uh, uh, there and available? Okay, I actually see that he's not in the room right now. So it may be that he has logged yeah. out. Can you hear uh, me? Can you hear ah, me? You are there again. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Can, we, can, we can hear you now, Hans Arold. No problem at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sorry for that. And this is part of the, uh, the whole issue with the. Uh, with these uh, these nice earphones that uh, tend to live their own life, yeah. So I'll reshare my presentation. Can I ask again. you to share? Yeah, if you could share your yeah. presentation again, yeah. thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, and also thanks to Professor Abraham for his uh, very very good introduction to the to 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 the issue. And uh, I'll jump straight into it. Uh, and I think uh, uh, what also Professor Ebert pointed to is that uh, one of the key things is that the market reform, uh, unfortunately, is not a product. It is a process. And it's an uh, evolutionary, uh, never-ending process. So again, coming from Norway, uh, we did our market reform, uh, got our Energy Act in 91 and opened our market in 1993. We are still spending more time on business development from both the power exchange as well as the regulatory uh, side today than we did in the early days. So unfortunately, this is not something that we can decide that we'll implement over the next uh, three, four years, and then we are finished. Because of course, what is also very important when you look at the uh, national reform is that it involves a lot of different uh, players and a lot of different processes. 
Uh, uh, so you see in the bottom here, kind of the fundamental, uh, let's say, parts of the of the market. So we have generators. You got transmission and distribution systems. You got uh, a retail market or representing the the consumer side. Uh, you have always had the system operator in place. Uh, a market operator, even though that you haven't had the market operator up to now, you still have, uh, let's say, a way to solve the price setting of, uh, of, of, of power. But of course, what we will uh, see now with this new market reform is that uh, a market operator with new services and products emerging. And the key thing here is that, uh, especially now in this very changing world, you also need to uh, accept that this market reform needs to be uh, based on an agile process, meaning that uh, independent of how many good consultants or uh, good people from system operation, from, from generation side, you put together and write uh, a nice design. The only thing uh, that is certain is that uh, in the uh, near future, that will be not obsolete, but there will be new changes that is required. So you need to have a flexibility, uh, uh, let's say, built into the, the reform process. But if you look at kind of the market in uh, uh, that we are trying to establish, again, at a very high level, it's very easy. We are trying to essentially, uh, by having a market in place, to let the price, so the willingness for generators to produce and the willingness for buyers to consume be the determinating factor for uh, how we are running our power sector. Uh, and this is again illustrated in the in the left hand side of the of the slide where you can see that again it is through a market price we decide which generators that will be running to meet the meet the demand and what we will uh, save for later. And when you look at the power market, uh, uh, again, looking at the two <laughs> the two words that is 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 comprising this, uh, uh, it, it indicates that there is a combination of market thinking and let's say more uh, power power uh, operation. And uh, uh, we have been joking for some years on on kind of the happy marriage between the economist and the engineer which should be the basis for the market. But there is a lot of truth in that as well. Because again, of course, if you ask somebody here represented by John Maynard Keynes as the uh, inventor of the market cross, if you operate a market, you would like to see liquid markets, a lot of market participants, few constraints with large trading areas. Uh, of course, then uh, uh, a lot of competing buyers and sellers and very few, if none, uh, uh, differentiation between the, the buyers and the sellers. And of course, an engineer looking at after the power system would like to see the market being uh, representing the underlying fiscal power system. He wants to see trading areas with all the bottlenecks in the network being represented in the market. He wants his product to be customized to the real need. Uh, uh, that he sees from an operation point of view. And of course, uh, the operator of the power system would like to know everything about everybody. And then, of course, we need to try to uh, match or marriage these two kind of a bit diverging uh, uh, wishes for a market. And of course, ideally, in, in this setup, we should also like to see a third factor here, which always comes in as, as one of the, the biggest issues in any market reform, and that is, of course, politics. But anyhow, a market, and I think this is, this is also an important statement, that to say that the market by itself is a new tool in the toolbox. The market will not generate a new megawatt hour, but it shall help uh, both the buyers and the sellers uh, uh, to find let's say, an optimal utilization of all their needs. So again, kind of saying it, it's essentially built on the willing buyer, willing seller setup. So again, a seller, a generator needs to figure out what kind of prices he needs for his generation. And likewise, the buyers need to figure out how much am I willing to pay for the power to support my customers. 
And then when we are trying to look at some of the historical development here. So again, this uh, slide shows, shows kind of the, the a normal evolution of this. So where you go from, and by the way, all countries in the world started with this monopoly setup in the power sector. So having the national electricity company. And then moving to uh, some steps, the normal kind of, if I can say, progression would be to move to a single buyer where you have some competition in generation, a wholesale competition where we also allow, let's say, the retail uh, companies to take part uh, and then maybe ultimately end up in retail competition. So then all of us as end consumers will have a real choice of, uh, of uh, who we buy power from. And there is an natural evolution of this but however as i always like to say kind of this might not be the only part so again referring to japan as a as a as an interesting case because they they went more or less from a monopoly situation uh, uh at least between the different different zones that they had into full retail competition still uh they didn't compete on the power price because the power price was uh, was essentially set by 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 uh, the monopolistic uh, generator in each of the uh, in each of the country or in each of the zones in in, in Japan. So uh, you can see that even though I might not support that step, uh, there are many ways that can can uh, that you can take and potentially leapfrog or find uh, a shortcut in 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 this generic setup. Also, when you look at the historical evolution of market models, uh, uh, if you go back kind of 30 years, 40 years in time, there was a very kind of distinct uh, different view on this, where we had kind of the pool, the centralized pool market, uh, very often then governed by, again, the electricity company, uh, where you have uh, essentially everything sold by a central uh, a unit where all the uh, scheduling was uncentralized. Uh, they were taking power from generators and giving or providing them to the, to the consumers. So there was a unidirectional exchange, uh, balancing and everything was sold by the pool. And you had uh, in, in certain markets, you saw the emergence of, of bilateral contract market, which I maybe could call this, uh, or call, call a, a more anarchistic market model, where essentially you, a trade between companies, uh, you don't have detailed information of generation sources or anything like this. Uh, uh, the trade is then by, thereby bi-directional, so again, trading between companies. But of course, to try to, uh, let's say, manage, I shouldn't say the mess, you need to have a balancing mechanism so somebody looks out to the balance at the end of all of these, these trades. Uh, uh, both of them had the drawbacks, uh, and what we have seen kind of over the years is a convergence of market models where, of course, the pool market, one of the issues, especially when you got private uh, participation into this, is of course that with the pool that is running mostly on the short-term optimization basis, you need to introduce some way of having longer-term uh, price certainty. Uh, so you saw that either bilateral fiscal contracts or bilateral financial contract or contract for differences emerging, let's say, outside of the pool uh, to, to allow for, for uh, price hedging. And in my anarchistic bilateral contract market, we saw also that uh, people uh, started to understand that we need to figure out a better way to organize this by having a power exchange or a market operator in between. So again, uh, if you look at now uh, these differences between Kind of a centralized market, as you can see in this, uh, in, in 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 on the left hand side, and decentralized on the on the right hand side. I will not go through this in detail. I think actually uh, Professor Ebert did a good summation. But again, the main difference between this is that, from a fiscal point of view, again in the centralized market, uh, dispatch uh, uh, scheduling and unit commitment are done by the one central entity, while in the decentralized one, the different participants are allowed to self-dispatch, meaning that they decide uh, uh, how to run their own uh, units. One difference that is listed here, nodal versus zonal pricing, I think it's uh, 
both of them are trying to have a geographical representation of of uh, of the underlying market and uh, to me it's uh, so sometimes splitting here between the difference because Australia has a, has a, has a node system but the biggest node in Australia is far larger than many of the zones in Europe for instance and then on, on the market side uh, very often also a centralized market have kind of one market entry so you deliver uh, 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 your your uh, uh, bid and your information to the to the market operator once, and they utilize that to both do day head intraday balancing and reserves. Uh, very often a gross market, uh, and that means that you have uh, uh, few options as a company or as a, as a generator or a consumer to change your position, uh, and that is all often let's say a common price falling out of this while in the decentralized uh, setup you will have multiple let's say semi-competing uh, options to trade you can choose yourself uh, most most of the markets are voluntary so that means that you are settling the the results in different markets and you have many different uh, trading opportunities so again uh, as as uh, Professor Ebrard said, kind of this is what we can say the North or the American model, uh, and the other one is the EU model. What we see now uh, internationally, there is a trend going towards uh, decentralization, mainly driven by, uh, uh, let's say, the 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 change in in uh, in, in in the underlying power uh, system. In any case. Uh, what both market models are trying to do is to maximize the social economic welfare. And we see that uh, this is being done in, 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 uh, in, in all markets that are essentially trying to do what I had on my first slide, finding the cheapest resources to meet the demand. I will not go through this in, in any detail. So again, this is kind of the, the market cross that we talked about earlier. And again, the market cross that is being implemented in many markets is not a power market cross. It is kind of generically for all uh, commodity markets. And just to mention uh, on the regional markets, because this is also part of the puzzle uh, for, for South Africa, how to integrate with, for instance, Southern African power pool. And I think uh, if you look at this statement, so allow for regional cooperation, maintaining national control of the assets is at the heart of this. So again, you shall utilize the opportunities that exist to both buy and sell with your neighbors, but you should, shall not give away your control of the assets. And again, that flexibility from a regional point of view needs to be maintained over time. Also important is, uh, a two-tier di di dispatch kind of approach to this. So again, you will participate, and I think Keith will 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 talk a bit about this this later. I think the key here is that you utilize the opportunities in the regional market. You take that into account with your national, uh, let's say, operation, and then combining those two, you get the local national dispatch coming out of this. Again. This is taken from, from, from a report that we did uh, some way back, where also Professor Ebert and Keith and a lot of other people on this call participating. And this is my key recommendation without going into detail. You need a market reform team. I've been part of so many market reforms, and in all the successful ones, I can easily go back and point to the people, the real people that made this happen. And either if this is kind of a, something that is created from, from a ministry or from, from, uh, from a regulator, or if this is kind of more loosely, let's say, organized, you need to have somebody that oversees and tries to drive this. And I think this is one of the key recommendations that we have had. Also, the word stepwise will be extremely important. You need to evolve the market over time and take steps. Don't try to do a big bang. I will not talk about California. I was there in the late 90s. I know exactly what happened when you are trying to revolutionize your market overnight and not allow neither the system or people or anybody adopt to this. 
you also need the long-term strategy again referring back to some of the points from professor Eberhardt. i've taken this example from turkey where they had the very clear of course they did some of their unbundling early days but they did the strategy paper here in 2004 and in to a large extent they followed that and were able not in 2013 but in 2014 and 15 to meet their goal of implementing a market the road wasn't that as narrow as the strategy document talked about, but in general, uh, the direction was given, and I think this is also missing from South Africa at the moment. Again, to support transitions in market reforms, we can do special purpose vehicles. And again, I, the, the CPA, the Central Purchasing Agency, that is being implemented in, in, in South Africa, and I know Keith will have more on this in the next session. Uh, is a way to support this because one of the biggest issues in the market reform is it's easy to, to agree on where you want to go, but the question is how do we get from where you are today into this? And this is again something that has been implemented throughout the world uh, as, a, as, a, as a very good mechanism to drive uh, market reforms. So again, not the PowerPoint solution. There are real examples of this being implemented throughout the world. And then I'll end with uh, uh, this slide uh, because one of also my key points to this is that we need to now, when we are embarking on trying to figure out the solution for South Africa going forward, uh, we need to build the solution for tomorrow, not for yesterday. And we see, uh, trying to summarize this kind of here, of course, climate change is a big one. Consu uh, consumption pattern is another big one that is changing. So again, where I come from, 80% of, of uh, uh, new cars are electrical. Uh, this is a huge problem because then you have a big load that is moving around and you cannot control when or where it's charging. But it's also a huge opportunity when you have uh, uh, all of these gigawatts of batteries that there are test projects now looking at can we utilize that for, for generation? Uh, we have, uh, and one of the solutions to all of this is of course technology uh, that we have now with smart metering, with uh, big data, with AI, all of the new things that we hear about, it's also imp uh, easy to implement new and better solutions for this. Because again, the trend, as we know, we go are going from conventional to renewable, uh, and what is also very important that part of the huge problem in Europe is that we go from a centralized system to a decentralized system. So essentially the TSOs in Europe have always had the, the, the task of overseeing the system operation. But now in the new world, 80% of the generation capacity is in the distribution network where the TSO doesn't have visibility. So this is kind of creating a lot of issues. And I think the key word that falls out of this is that of course you need to have more in, in intelligent market and smarter grids, uh, both on the transmission and distribution. But you also need to get access to some of the flexibility that lies within the, the whole power system, especially now that we are running into a, a much more intermittent uh, world and to get access to local flexibility uh, will be a key. And I'll end with this, uh, uh, my, my favorite market reform quote, even though that I'm pretty sure Martin Luther King wasn't talking about market reforms when they said this. But again, I think the word persistence is a key. You need to push forward and you need to kind of try to get one small step in the right direction day by day when you are doing a market reform. Uh, it might or it will go slower than you than you want or expect, but you need to have that stamina to continue, continue, continue. And by that, I think I'll end on back to you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Hans Erold. Uh, if I could ask you to stop sharing your presentation. Uh, yeah, you know, I, what I take away from this is that we are behind the curve in South Africa. We know that. Uh, but we are where we are, and uh, let's see the positive in that, and that is that there is now a wealth of experience out there to draw on, 
Uh, and we also have uh, the experience of people like um, Hans Erold, uh, who have got years of real, real hands-on experience uh, in this uh, sector, in the uh, market reform across a number of countries. And uh, we can learn from this. We don't have to learn necessarily the hard way. Uh, we, we can uh, draw on this experience uh, uh, that is available to us. And, uh, and I think that's the positive that I take out of this. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Hans Erold. And it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Keith Bowen uh, at Eskom. Uh, and Keith is a power systems economist and senior manager in the market operator uh, in the Eskom transmission division. He has extensive experience in energy economics and planning uh, in the power sector. And he is responsible for developing wholesale price mechanisms, uh, supporting internal transfers within the vertically integrated utility and payments to independent power producers. Uh, with the restructuring of Eskom, he's now involved in developing future market mechanisms and trading arrangements between the transmission subsidiary of Eskom and other industry participants. Keith has a bachelor's degree in computer science and economics and a master's degree in economics from Wits University. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Keith. I can't think of a person who's got more experience and is more deeply involved in the whole uh, evolution of um, market reform in South Africa. And it would be great to hear from you of your insights uh, you know, and how Eskom is looking at this uh, to serve the needs of the local market, as we've heard um, uh, Hans Arold speak, uh, you know, about his international experience. So over to you now, Keith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, thanks for having me on your uh, webinar. And in particular, thanks to Anton and Hans Arold for setting the scene uh, for my discussion. So a lot of the information that I'm talking about kind of pretty much has been discuss and I'm going to try and put in a little bit more context into the South African uh, proposals for the South African market and, and talk a little bit more detail about each of the, the platforms and how we see the platforms working together. So a lot of the discussion that I'm going to talk about is really the view from the Eskom Transmission Division uh, and specifically the work that we've been doing around the market operator. I think importantly, as has been identified uh, by Anton, when we talk about the transmission system operator, is understanding the different roles that this, that transmission system operator would play. And we talk about the TSO, that it, as big, obviously is the transmission network, the system operator, but it also includes the market operator component. Uh, some people call it the TISMO, but you know, we just pre pretty much stick to the concept of the TSO. And in this role, or in, these, in this function, you have the network operator, which is really the, the business that focuses on the grid and ensuring that the, we're expanding the grid, we're uh, upgrading the grid, we're doing the refurbishments and the planning around the, the network to get the transmission level. We also then have the system operator, which we, as also identified, we've had the system operator for many years. The idea is the system operator has a similar function into the future as what it does now under the vertically integrated utility, but more importantly, it has to deal with more role players and in a more complex environment, particularly as the market uh, unravels. I think one of the important things when we talk about how the process works now, where we have wheeling taking place with physical bilaterals, what we call the physical bilaterals, but a wheeling contract between buyers and sellers without centralized markets. So we have competition already taking place. We have a lot of uh, new generation being built in order to supply customers directly through wheeling contracts. A lot of that is sort of happening without the central uh, network, uh, kind of central market mechanisms, but it also means for a large percentage of the time, the system operator is almost flying blind. It has no idea of where the generation is going to be coming from the next day. At the moment, obviously the volumes are small, but as we're adding more and more uh, of these uh, generating uh, capability and customers are exercising more choice, the system operator needs greater visibility of what's actually happening on the network and being able to plan around it. So the thinking behind the centralized markets is just to create the platforms for that information. And also, obviously, with the creation of the market operator, which is our next kind of role, is to try and facilitate that trade more efficiently. So while we have physical bilaterals and the multi-market model, 
would continue the expectation that the physical bilaterals, the wheeling contracts would continue, that those don't come to an end. The idea is that by creating these physical trading platforms uh, where you can trade physical energy on a day ahead and intraday and real-time basis, the idea is that that physical information now actually is provided to the system operator and we have visibility of what is going to be happening on the grid uh, at any particular point in time. And that's just makes the management of the whole process a little bit more efficient. I think also importantly, the market operator is not a buyer and a seller. It's not trading. It's just creating platforms on which others can buy and sell and trade with one another. It does that through a set of rules. And uh, Anton also mentioned the idea of the market code. The market code, in a very similar way to the grid code, establishes the, the, the rules around which these platforms will operate and allow for people to be able to buy and sell. We do have uh, the, a day ahead market, which is really sort of a, de, uh, a voluntary uh, market trading mechanism where you can have willing buyers, willing sellers trading with one another. We have supply offers and demand side bids. And the idea of the market operators to try and match those, clear the market, and then ensure that settlements takes place for, for those uh, contracts that are awarded as part of that process. At the same time that we're doing day ahead energy, we're also focusing on day ahead reserves, the ability for the system operator to acquire the reserve capability from multiple uh, participants in the market and ensure that they have that dispatchable energy available on the day to ensure uh, grid stability and uh, reliability. But those platforms then provide for a sort of a day ahead physical position, uh, as has been indicated by Hans and by uh, Anton, this idea of almost like a centralized uh, dispatch where we take bids and offers, we produce a schedule, and as much as possible, that schedule represents a physical delivery capability. So we build into that that you would have a network, uh, sorry, a, a generator constraints. So the kind of limitations that ramping, ramping constraints, minimum up and down times, those sort of uh, issues are built into your centralized market so that when we get a schedule coming out, the system operator has high confidence that that is actually achievable, which is quite different from the uh, the European style where the physical issues are actually have to be dealt with after the fact of the, the day ahead closing. And, and that really becomes a relationship issue between the balanced responsible parties and the system operator to ensure that dispatch can actually take place. We also allow for an intraday uh, market, an intraday energy market. And this is really for generators, consumers, traders to be able to shift their positions if something's actually happened uh, on the ground. So the idea is that in the day ahead, you have the best information you have available. A generator can offer their capability. The market then decides what it's taking or not from that availability and would dispatch accordingly. If the generator now finds that they can't actually offer that energy anymore, either they've tripped or there's a load loss or something has happened, they're able to go and adjust their position. And the intraday would almost act similarly to the day ahead market, but it clears every six hours, and at least from our perspective, would clear every six hours and produce a revised schedule, which provides information to everybody uh, about what the new positions would be. And it, obviously the prices would have changed because now your optimal position from the day ahead has been readjusted based on new information. And then we have the balancing mechanism, which is really trying to bring all that, uh, all the information from the, int from the day ahead, the intraday, and then allow for the system operator to dispatch to ensure the system balance uh, in real time. Importantly, when we talk about the physical bilaterals, as I said, we don't expect that everyone has to go through the day ahead market. It's not a mandatory centralized market, at least from our perspective, you allow for the physical bilaterals, but we do expect then that parties are engaging in physical bilaterals become what we call balanced responsible parties. They provide the information of what they expect to produce and or consume to the, the, the market operator on, in the day ahead submissions. So they're not exposed to the market prices or anything, they're not, they're not dispatchable but their, their, their position is, is a, kind of provided as almost like a must run to the system operator. So we know that we can manage around that inf uh, expected delivery or consumption. What happens then that the balancing mechanism then checks on all those positions, including the, the physical bilaterals, those positions that were declared, 
people now have to ensure that they have actually executed on those, either as a generator or theoretically as a consumer, to make sure that those positions have been upheld. If they are out of balance, the balancing mechanism kicks in and the system operator makes decisions and then assigns the cost of those decisions onto the, those that cause the imbalance on the system. So that's quite an important uh, series of functions. As identified, a lot of those are physical short-term markets. We're dealing with day ahead, intraday, real time. We're not dealing uh, in these markets with the long-term. Uh, and as Hans has uh, pointed out, there has to be some level of either financial bilaterals or the physical bilaterals that overlay the entire process to ensure that there's some sort of bankability or long-term certainty in the prices going forward to ensure new capacity is built. So you then can expect that either the market operator or other players, the Janusburg Stock Exchange, the uh, you know banks might offer over-the-counter or exchange-driven uh, forward contracting to allow for that price setting five years out, 10 years out, which then can give that bankability uh, in the process. The fourth role player that is quite important from the TSO position is what we call the central purchasing agency. And the central purchasing agency has three kind of key roles uh, for uh, even in, in the future TSO. The first is that it is still the, the buyer for the Section 34 independent power producer contract. So the PPAs that have been signed under the renewable IPP program, the PICA program, the risk mitigation program, the battery program, all these programs that have been determined under the Section 34 IPP program would not be changed. They don't uh, disappear. The idea then is that the central purchasing agency is purchasing that power under those PPAs and then essentially on selling that into the day ahead market. Now, for immediately people might be concerned, is there some sort of conflict of interest between the central purchasing agency uh, being able to participate in the market and other traders or players in the market? The idea is that the CPA is almost like a, a, a dormant trader. They kind of they're just passing on uh, information that's coming from the IPPs into the market. They're not taking on a position for profitability. They're just basically the IPPs declare availability, particularly from the renewable IPP program, and they provide that into the market. Similarly, for the dispatchable generators, they just have the costs and they provide that information. If there is any difference between, obviously there's going to be a price difference between the section 34 IPPs under the PPA and what the market price is, that then becomes a legacy item. It's dealing what we call the legacy charge, that theoretically any overs or unders that are taking place between those two price regimes, the central purchasing agency either has to pass on the benefit if the price was better or the cost to consumers uh, that are in the market mainly because we need to make sure that we can continue with those programs for the rest of the, the PPA life. The second role of the CPA is to try and manage that transition. And I'll spend a little bit of on time on that shortly, is that when we open the market, the idea is that, yes, we have almost, as, as Hans says, the big bang approach where everybody's in the market, those who want to be, uh, but the generate, ESKIM generation, ESKIM distribution are in the market from day one. But then we have what we call the vesting contracts, which is really hedging agreements between the CPA and those parties to ensure that we can transition from the sort of regulated tariff environment to a full competitive environment. And those vesting contracts allow for reduced exposure, uh, reduced volumes under those trades and increased exposure to the market prices. So the CPA then has that second role to kind of help with the transition mechanisms as we get closer and to, closer to the full market exposure. The third is a potential that in the future, you still have a capability for the TSO to be doing IRP, integrated resource plan type studies to indicate risks into the future of what type of capacity the system would require, particularly if there's a possibility we might need some sort of backup, whether it be batteries or gas, and being able to either go out and procure that or through the market operator to operate some sort of capacity market to set the prices for capacity five years out, so three years out, whatever our kind of term that we would need to provide that sort of certainty. So that that future capacity either can be contracted as a, almost like a central buyer, as the CPA acting in that role to ensure that certainty in the market or operate a, a capacity market itself to ensure that can happen. 
as I said, we then also have these physical bilaterals, and that's what makes it a multi-market model, that we have these different platforms and allowing also that physical bilaterals are what is kind of driving uh, some of the trades, and we try and facilitate that between the different uh, role players. When we talk about the day ahead, I think it's quite important to identify that on the day ahead, we're dealing with offers from generators. So we've got a supply curve that is based on the marginal cost as uh, or at least short run marginal cost as Hans was identifying. These are sort of the supply options that are made available into the market by the various participants. We then match that with demand. And hopefully we have some for us responsiveness in the demand curve. So it's not just a vertical line that's everyone saying this is what I'm going to consume, but it's also the ability for consumers, large power users, retailers, to be able to adjust their expectation of uh, consumption based on where the prices are. And the, the merger of those two or the intersection of those two then establishes what the central clearing price would be for everyone on the day ahead market. It's quite important that we also consider the idea that you bring in network constraints into this environment. So on the day ahead, in the, we have what we call an unconstrained schedule, which is the constraint, only constraints that you really figure in are the generator constraints. As we said, your minimum up and down times, your ramping capabilities, startup costs, all those things are factored into the day ahead uh, outcome. And that gives us an unconstrained schedule where the supply and demand meet. We then also have to then factor in a network constraint and that that becomes quite an important uh, consideration into the future as well. That the network constraints, both at a transmission level and at a distribution level, because we're going to have a lot of generators connecting in at the distribution level, you then have to consider how does that change the outcome? So you have an unconstrained schedule, you have everyone has positions based on the optimal uh, outcome from the unconstrained. You then adjust all of those based on the network constraints. And then it's the responsibility of the system operator to essentially be doing the counter trade. So it's buying additional energy from generators uh, on one side of the constraint and then reducing uh, output from generators on the others and dealing with a loss of profit kind of position that applies to those generators. And that then becomes constraint generation, which is almost an ancillary service, which we would try and recover from uh, all consumers downstream as part of that process. When we then talk about the balancing mechanism, the theory then at the day ahead, after the day ahead trades, we have a whole lot of generators, and here this is just for illustrative purposes, generators who establish their positions. We have maybe some more expensive generators who haven't yet been scheduled because they are outside the market at this stage from a pricing perspective. We have some large power users who would have established what their consumption would look like, and some of them have their own generation uh, that they're able to replace from what's coming from the market. Similarly, we might have retailers and they would have, some of them would have generators and some of them might even have demand response capability built into their contracts with their customers. But at the end of the day ahead, we have the physical bilaterals that have been declared as well as your day ahead market. You now have positions that are established. As I said, we then allow for an intraday where we kind of rebalance ever so slightly based on the, the changes Sometimes they might be big changes uh, where you might have, for example, generators backing each other up or themselves up uh, inside one generating power station, or you have a whole lot of retailers readjusting their positions based on uh, revised forecasts and then other generators having to step in and provide that. Those get settled and changed as a separate market uh, intraday auction and payments made accordingly. But what the system operator then can do is after that, take all the, so what we just call it the merit order or pricing stacks of the allowed volumes that are still available uh, with a, a volume and a price associated with each increment as to what the system operator can call up if it needs additional generation. And similarly, we have a downward uh, merit order or stack in terms of what can be backed off if there is excess generation. And what we suggest, again, from a, it's a what this is one of the choices that Anton was talking about, is that you have a two balancing price, two balancing prices for each hour for those that cause an imbalance in the upward direction and those that cause the imbalance in the downward direction in order to incentivize everybody to be as honest as they can and as accurate as they can day ahead about their positions. Um, but again, that's a choice. The alternative is to have one price, which is the net position in either direction. Um, but there are benefits in doing that. One of the important things around balancing is to make sure that we're not overcharging for balancing, that your penalty is so high and so punitive 
that everyone backs themselves up. So everyone's building batteries or they're withholding capacity from the day ahead market in the, in the ability to be able to back themselves up. And then you get, because of the extreme prices, you now get a very inefficient system because now you're not trading and optimizing all these different resource capabilities or reserve capabilities around the, the country. You now have people backing themselves up because the balancing is so punitive. So that again is a choice that you make in the design um, and why we propose that to some extent you kind of limit uh, the, the extremes of those prices. I think in the last couple of minutes that I have left just to highlight this idea that there's, this trans there's a transition. If all things being equal, uh, that we kind of are able to open the market uh, 1st of April 2025, um, and we now have uh, sort of the market starts and we have willing buyers and sellers, we can force in the ESKIM generators and the ESKIM distribution that they have to be participants to create that liquidity and certainty in the market, but we hedge. Um, so we go from this regulated phase to the full market phase over maybe a five-year period, and every year the hedged volumes decline so that each of the generators that have a vesting contract, they're fully hedged uh, in year one, but in year two, they're only 80% hedged and then 60, 40, 20 until not hedged at all through the central purchasing agency. As that hedge is reduced, so they can start learning to hedge directly with one another. So it's not that hedging falls away, but it's just not a kind of almost forced hedge through these vesting contracts. It becomes a voluntary hedging process between willing buyers and willing sellers on forward contracting, maybe even exchange traded for, uh, contracts into the future. And that, that process then manages the transition. The idea then is that we still would have some vesting contracts. And here we're talking about specifically the renewable IPPs and the other section 34 IPP PPAs that would continue, that they're not being replaced. Those continue for the remainder of those contracts. It is possible that there might be some of the ESKIM generators and maybe even others where we determine that they are going to be stranded in the new market, that there's a risk that they can't, they won't be profitable, they won't be able to operate efficiently. You may give them vesting contracts over time. That is going to be one of those interesting questions that we have to deal with in terms of the transition. And that then becomes the point as to whether or not those are for a remainder of life or if it's limited to the five years. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into this now because we've run out of time, but it's just to highlight what Anton has identified. A lot of this started back in 1996 within Eskom. We had the Eskom power pool that ran for almost 10 years um, between 1996 and 2005 to encourage generators to learn about trading and to try and drive some efficiency. And of course, in those days, we had excess capacity. So there was a lot of uh, interest from generators to be able to bid in and to ensure dispatch on a daily basis. And that then also fed into the multi-market model that was done in 2003. So a lot of the work that we've proposing from a TSO perspective is actually the work that was done under the multi-market model. The big difference now is looking at capacity into the future and how we trade capacity, which in the, at that stage, we thought forward energy prices would be sufficient to encourage new investment. But now capacity really does is seen as a separate uh, product that we have to manage. Thanks, Chris, over back over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Keith. Um, it is heartening to know uh, that a lot of work has already been done. Um, so not only do we have available at our disposal the experiences internationally and the experiences of people like Hans Erold, who have really done this uh, in many, many countries, uh, but there's also been this work that has been done by Eskom. Uh, and by other parties who we're going to hear from uh, in the next session. Uh, you know, who, who, so we, we, we're not starting uh, from scratch with a clean slate. Uh, we've got a lot at our disposal. Uh, and I think this uh, is, is going to be very helpful. Uh, we are where we are, as I say. Uh, we are behind, uh, but let's use that uh, to our advantage now, I believe. Anyway, um, uh, thanks very much for your input, Keith. Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you uh, Jason van der Poel uh, of Weber Wenzel. Uh, Jason has expertise in all aspects of project development and finance. He has advised lenders, sponsors, and contractors on limited recourse project financings, on public-private partnerships, government support partnerships, and joint ventures, construction and operations contracts, 
power purchase agreements, procurement syndicated and term loans, bond issues, and securitizations. Jane, Jason's practice has focused on transactional and regulatory aspects of renewable energy IPP procurements. He has an LLM in banking and finance from the University College in London, and an LLB and a Bachelor of Business Science degrees from UCT, the University of Cape Town. And he's an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa. Now, I know that he has been deeply involved uh, in the uh, draft um, Electricity Regulation oh. Amendment uh, Act bill, which is uh, going through the parliamentary processes at the moment. Um, there's been a series of uh, public comment phases. And I know that he's been deeply involved uh, in commenting on behalf of organized business and others uh, on the, um, the, you know, these legal uh, processes, the uh, legislation or draft legislation, or shall we say, it's now a bill that is going before parliament, uh, hopefully to be enacted uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we're really interested to hear what you have to say on this, Jason. Give us an idea of the timelines and the, the reality of this or the uh, possibilities of this becoming a reality soon. And it's a great pleasure now to hand over to you uh, for your presentation. Over to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a real honor to be on this panel with, uh, with my esteemed panelists. I'm very grateful uh, to be here and to be speaking to you all today. Um, Chris, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you well, thanks, uh, Jason. Excellent. Just checking, thank you very much. So the presentation is entitled Analysis of the Electricity Regulation um, Amendment Bill of uh, April 2023. And as Chris alluded in his introduction to me, one of my jobs was uh, to act pro bono for Business Unity South Africa, which coordinated a grouping consisting of the Energy Intensive Users Group, uh, Business for South Africa, and also Energy Council in taking a very cold read of the Electricity Regulation uh, Amendment Bill, analyzing it, participating in the MEDLAC process uh, of, of discussion of this bill, and finally submitting comments on this bill uh, to, uh, to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Uh, this process was coordinated by Happy Kambule of Business Unity South Africa, and also Sue Rawls of Rawls Law uh, fed into this process. So quite a number of minds uh, were applied to the text of the Act itself. And what I intend to do today is take you on a, a chronological journey through the Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill. Um, the more people I speak to, the more I find that there are misconceptions about what it says, what's in it, what's not in it. And hopefully this presentation will go some way to identifying what's in it and also identifying some of the contentious areas that we've had to engage with. So the uh, the agenda for my presentation is to look at a timeline of legislative developments in this particular space and then look at key amendments proposed by the electricity regulation amendment bill first a bird's eye view of the key changes then uh, just walking through the bill from beginning to end contentious changes to the definitions and then contentious changes to the sections of the electricity regulation act noting that some items are more contentious than others so looking at the timeline, we, we as Weber Wenzel first got involved um, when the first amendment bill came out in uh, the first, uh, the first one of these bills came out in March of 2021. And we started engaging with Business Unity South Africa in, um, in reading it. Um, in February 2022, the second uh, version was published, but not gazetted. Um, in March 2022, interested and affected parties submitted representations. This was after a quite lengthy process of review and critically analyzing what was in the bill. Then in July 2022, last year, the DMRE issued a further draft, uh, which we refer to as the 2022 Amendment Bill. And this was um, circulated by NEDLAC after a series of NEDLAC discussions, government, business, labor, and community. On the 23rd of August, 2023, we got a new draft of the bill, which we refer to as the 2023 Amendment Bill. And this is the bill, the bill that has now been tabled before Parliament. Um, in September 
2023, just last month, this bill was discussed at the Portfolio Committee on Mineral Resources and Energy. And on the 13th of October, public comment uh, was, was invited, and that was the day on which those comments were due. So many parties across the country, and, and indeed even um, uh, across the region, submitted uh, comments to the DMRE for consideration. And we were a part of that process. So some of what I'll be sharing with you today are our thought processes in uh, the key comments that we wanted to communicate to the DMRE. This is a, a slide that was prepared by Energy Council, just setting out where we are in the parliamentary process. Um, this is an optimistic timeline for processing of this electricity regulation amendment bill through parliament. And this slide indicates that the process is roughly only 33% complete. On the 23rd of August, 2023, the, the bill was introduced into the National Assembly. Uh, and this is approximately where we are now. Uh, we are waiting for approval of the bill by the uh, Portfolio Committee. It will then be passed by the National Assembly, hopefully in around February 2024, uh, signed, referred to the National Council of Provinces in March 2024. Um, this is referred to by the Energy Council as the dark era where Parliament changes. Uh, this, uh, we suspect, will be after our, our elections. The sixth Parliament will end and the seventh will begin. Then uh, the National Council of Provinces would need to pass the, the bill and then it would be assented into law. By this relatively optimistic timeline, we think that, that the Electricity Regulation Amendment Bill will therefore only become law in roughly March of 2025. So that's important to bear in mind given that the, the bill also caters for a five-year transition period. So that would be the full impact of the bill taking effect only then in 2030, to give you a sense of timelines for the, the introduction of this multi-market into uh, our South African environment. So key amendments that were introduced by the amendment bill would include um, what, what I would consider the, the four main provisions that change things. The first is section 34, which is entitled additional electricity, new generation capacity and ele electricity transmission infrastructure. Then there is section 34A, which uh, is entitled establishment duties, powers and functions of the transmission system operator SOC Limited, a new state-owned company. Then there's section 34B, which goes into some detail as to the powers and functions of the transmission system operator, the TSO. And there's four of them, uh, transmitter, system operator, market operator, and central purchasing agency. And then the fourth important change is section 35C, which speaks to the transition period of five years, uh, during which we'll, we'll then move to the functioning, the full functioning of this transmission system operator. So firstly, section 34, provides that the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy may, in the event of a market failure, emergency, or for purposes of ensuring security of energy supply in the national interests, after consultation with NERSA and the Minister of Finance, make various sorts of determinations. These determinations apply to additional electricity and new electricity transmission infrastructure. So parameters are set for the determinations for these two things, and there may be deviations from the integrated resource plan and the transmission development plan if in the national interest to do so. Um, if the minister wants to deviate from either of those plans, the deviation must be gazetted for public comment before it gets put into place. So that is one check and balance that is introduced into this new law. Then section 34A uh, provides for the establishment of the TSO with those four functions I mentioned. Section 34B, again, provides for the parameters of each of those functions, and 35C. This is an interesting one. It says there'll be a five-year transition period during which the National Transmission Company of South Africa, which, as you will know, is a wholly owned subsidiary of ESCOM currently, which has, been, um, which has received its licenses to trade and to, um, to transmit and distribute from NERSA. That entity, the subsidiary of ESCOM, will fulfill the functions of the TSO until the end of the transition period of five years, uh, and, and then there will be a transition to a competitive market. So those, to my mind, are the key changes. Now, just taking a step um, through the, the, um, 
the amendment bill itself. For those of you who've read the amendment bill, you'll know that it's quite difficult going in that it speaks to items that will change in the language, but doesn't present the language holistically. So what we did with uh, the team at Business Unity South Africa was to prepare a consolidated version of the act containing all of these amendments. And we were able to run compares against the current act as it, as it looks now, as against the 2022 amendments, the 2021 amendments, and we were able to see precisely what changed. And so we were able to generate a set of comments which went right to the heart of, of those contentious points that, that, uh, that changed. So there are four definitions that I wanted to point out in particular where there were changes. And um, one of them has to do with section 15.4 of the, the new act, tariff principles. That section provides that a generation licensee may charge a customer a tariff which has not been set or approved by the regulator where such tariff is charged pursuant to a direct supply agreement or arises as an outcome of a competitive market. So the intention of this the section is, is very good. What it's saying is that if you have a willing buyer and a willing seller in a competitive market, there doesn't need to be regulation of the price. That's what it says. But when you analyze the definition of direct supply agreement, it says um, direct supply agreement means an agreement for the sale of electricity between a generation licensee or trader acting in its capacity as such and a customer, whether such electricity is supplied directly or through a transmission power system or distribution power system. And here's the important bit, provided that the customer is not a generator, transmitter, distributor, system operator, or trader. That provisor at the end is uh, uh, sent, uh, set off some warning bells. Uh, the definition excludes generators, traders, and system operators as customers. The provisor to this definition must include generators and traders because NERSA should not regulate prices of private generators or traders where these private generators or traders are selling to other generators or traders. In other words, what we're trying to achieve through the definition of direct supply agreements is that NERSA should not be regulating energy sale contracts, power purchase between willing buyers and willing sellers. And this is what happens because of this proviso. The proviso and the definition should arguably also include the central purchasing agency and the market operator. The definition should not only apply to generation licensees, uh, as it says here, but also to generators who are exempted from licensing. So you'll know that Schedule 2 of the Electricity Regulation Act currently exempts certain activities from the need to license. These are uh, power plants of any size, whether with storage or without storage, and whether wheeling or not wheeling, from the need to apply for and, and obtain a license from NERSA. This, uh, this change happened in August 2021 and unlocked the, the current market that we're seeing for uh, private power. Um, if those, if those um, power plants that only need to register and do not need to get a license, uh, having benefited from this, this uh, cutting of red tape, um, are now also meant to be regulated by NERSA, we feel that that would defeat the purpose of the bill, hence our comment. Um, we heard Keith earlier speaking of physical bilateral transactions. Not a big point to make here, but when we read the definition of physical bilateral transactions, we were slightly confused. They refer to a transaction entered into by generators, customers, and traders for energy production, which involves the conclusion of a power purchase agreement through a central purchasing agency to meet demand and supply, as required by the system operator. Um, we found the term physical bilateral transaction misleading in the context of the system operator balancing demand and supply. Doesn't this describe ancillary services? Um, wouldn't distributors wish to have these ancillary services um, in a scenario in which the central purchasing agency procures electricity for, for balancing demand and supply? Is this, is this bilateral as between a willing buyer and willing seller? So we, we found the term physical misleading. Um, we propose national bilateral transaction or public bilateral transaction because it has to do with the national interests of balancing the grid. Also, we, we note that there's a reference to a, a CPA, a central purchasing agency, and we thought there was only going to be one central purchasing agency. Um, so maybe a small definitional point. Importantly, Section 34B4 enables these transactions through a transparent, non-discriminatory trading platform under, market, under the market operator's function. So that overall is a very good thing. 
So overall, the intention is good. It's really more a definitional point that we're, we're raising here. Um, the third of the four definitions I wanted to talk about is that of regulated transactions. So there are three new types of transactions introduced by this bill, physical bilateral transactions, regulated transactions, and market transactions. Market transactions are the ones that are between willing buyers and willing sellers. And here, regulated transactions means a transaction that requires regulatory approval or oversight specifically where the exercise of market power is likely or evident, for example, network charges. We had understood regulated transactions to be transactions that have their tariffs set by NERSA as the regulator. We think that this definition also is a bit misleading because it could include any project that needs to be registered. So you'll know that under Schedule 2 of the Act, certain projects um, are exempted from the need to license but must be registered. Does that mean that these projects are regulated transactions and therefore regulated by NERSA? We think that this must be clarified. Um, so that is the definition of regulated transactions. And then the, the final definition I wanted to refer to was the definition of transmission development plan. This um, In the 2022 amendment bill, there was a specific definition for the transmission development plan or TDP, the plan for the development of the national transmission power system referred to in certain sections. And it states the, the system operator is responsible for the development of the TDP. The, the 2023 amendment bill deletes the section, the definition, as well um, as, as well as that section regarding the system operator. The provisions around the mechanics of the development of the TDP have also been deleted, and we just don't understand why. The TDP is referred to in the 2023 amendment bill, but not by its defined name. So all that we recommend here is that because the transmission development plan is so central to the future well-being of South Africa's electricity system, its development, um, bringing on more transmission capacity, especially in places where um, the, the grid studies have revealed that there's a, a shortage or absence of, of transmission capacity, that there should be absolute clarity about this plan and how it is to come to be. Uh, we recommended that the definition be reinstated. Um, it should be clear who's responsible for the plan. For example, Section 35.3a provides that the regulator must after consultation with the minister, make rules regarding the content of the plan, but the Act no longer specifies in, in absolute terms who's responsible for making this plan. So those are the definitions. Moving now into uh, chronologically into the sections of the bill that we, that we examined, the first is a power of the regulator NERSA to mediate or arbitrate disputes between generators, transmitters, distributors, and traders um, and any other licensee or customer. Our only point here, not a massive point, was that we propose that private bilateral transactions, which are, uh, that term isn't defined, it's probably market transaction as, as defined in the bill, be excluded in order to limit nurses' role in willing buyer and willing seller uh, scenarios. As um, Business Unity South Africa uh, and the grouping that looked at this Part of our overarching intention was to check precisely what the regulator regulates and precisely what the minister regulates and work out whether their discretion is too wide and whether they have a hand in uh, a hand of possible interference into the smooth functioning of a liberalized market. And this is one of those areas where we think that actually willing buyers and willing sellers of electricity should not be uh, touched by the regulator. Another section um, that, that I'd like to mention is Section 9, which deals with registration. The 2022 Amendment Bill specifically included a section which provided any person who operates a generation facility contemplated in Item 2 of Schedule 2 must register that facility with the regulator in terms of the section. Uh, again, uh, Schedule 2 provides an exemption from the need to license. And what this section did was it brought the the uh, question of which projects must be registered and which projects must be licensed into the main body of the act we found this to be a very good thing because we think that the schedule is relatively easy for the legislature to amend whereas um, the main body of the act it might be more complicated and um, we would like to make it um, in, entrenched enshrined in our law that large private renewable energy facilities, for example, only need to be registered with NERSA and do not need to be licensed. 
So our recommendation, in short, was a, a reconciliation of the provisions in the main body of the Act and the schedule around who's exempted, who must be licensed, who must be registered, and make sure that the main body of the Act uh, says who must be registered. We, we also noted Section 94E that provides that the regulator must make registration subject to the payment of fees imposed by licensees for the granting for granting registrants access to their network. We think that these fees should be approved by the regulator. In other words, the regulator should play a balancing role, a, a role of oversight, making sure that licensees are acting equitably and transparently and not charging exorbitant fees for use of their, of their system. The next item, uh, which is quite contentious, is Section 10, which has to do with an application for a license. And I'd preface this comment by saying most of the projects that I deal with in the ordinary course uh, are not licensed projects. They are registered projects because they fall within the exemption in Schedule 2. But to the extent that a project does have to get a license, this section applies. And it provides that an application for a license must include evidence of compliance with any integrated resource plan applicable at that point in time, or provide reasons for any deviation for approval of the minister. For those of us who've been operating in, in the market for uh, since the time before IPPs were active or tried to become active, um, you'll know that this, that compliance with the RRP and the minister acting as a gatekeeper of those projects which got uh, exemptions uh, or deviations from the RRP um, was quite a moot point. NURSA would not license projects that would not get um, that would um, that would deviate from the RP, and the minister um, had a complete discretion whether or not to allow these projects. So um, we would, we recommended that this uh, section be removed from the bill, um, and that um, we said that the exemption schedule is relatively easily changed by the minister, and private power sales should uh, could become licensable again, which would, would uh, fly against the principle of reducing red tape. It should be made clear that this applies to public procurement programs. Private projects used to require ministerial deviations under the section, so it's desirable that the section should not apply to private projects. So that's our recommendation. Section 14 contains a provision regarding the conditions of licenses. And one of the, the conditions which jumped out at us was the ability of the regulator to set conditions regulating the revenues of licensees. Our overall view is that the section could be problematic in that the regulator could reach into uh, private businesses who are uh, generating power as part of a portfolio of other business activities and regulate their overall revenues. And we don't think that that should be the power of the regulator in a liberalized market. So, um, we just noted that the section, we think the section should be amended because NOSA shouldn't be regulating the revenues of traders in a liberalized market. The wording could subject companies to regulation of their overall revenues by NOSA, and it is wide enough to cover the revenues of municipalities and may restrict municipalities in their functions. So those are the main thoughts uh, there. Section 21 deals with the power and duties of licensees. And the section states that a generation licensee uh, shall be entitled to sell electricity produced by the generation facility to which its license relates without holding a trading license. This section, um, which is from the 2022 amendment bill, served to cut red tape, and um, it hasn't been included in the 2023 amendment bill. So we we recommended that it be included. Uh, I see Chris, you're you're on screen. I think indicating that I'm nearing the end of my my time. So just to uh, fly through the last, which I think are, are quite important points uh, around section 34. Um, the first point here is just that certain powers were deleted from the 2022 amendment bill. And we, we have asked questions as to why and where they are and how those things will be regulated. This section in the subsection of section 34 uh, provided in 2022 that the RP should be revised every three years. We think that that's a very important check and balance for ministerial responsibility, and that hasn't been pulled through into the 23 Amendment Bill, and we've raised the question, why not? Um, we know that the RP 2010 uh, was long in coming. 
the RP 2019 was nine years in coming, and now we're four years over, and our RP is now out of date. Uh, Section 34.1 also um, uh, deals with the minister making determinations um, um, after consultation with the regulator, and we think that should be in consultation with. That's a very technical legal point, but um, the wording around in consultation with would provide for greater levels of scrutiny of ministerial action. Um, the wording around tendering uh, on a on the basis of a fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost-effective uh, basis has been deleted, and we think that that should remain for obvious reasons. Um, we've made the point about uh, transmission infrastructure, so I won't go over that one again. I think the final point that I'd like to raise has to do with vesting contracts. Uh, Keith spoke earlier about vesting contracts. And, and uh, vesting contracts refer to contracts between the National Transmission Company, South Africa, and an ESCOM generator or a distribution licensee. Um, our main point here is that the wording doesn't indicate the price at which ESCOM would sell uh, its power under these vesting contracts. It's, it talks about specified prices, but it doesn't say who will set that price and what that price will be. Uh, we wouldn't want the price to undermine a competitive market. And uh, so we've recommended that the ESCOM generation price should be regulated. The pricing of these contracts must be approved by NURSA. And the addition of the words as approved by the regulator would provide clarity in this regard. So I'll leave it there. There were a couple of more slides, but noting the time, uh, I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Jason. And fear not, we will be sharing all these slides with all the um, attendees today, as well as publicly. Uh, and so these additional points that you haven't been able to cover will be covered. I must say, it gives me great comfort to know that there are people like Jason and companies like Weber Wenzel and people like Sue Rose and her company, uh, Rose Law, who, uh, on behalf of people like Busa, uh, and uh, and others uh, scrutinize these documents at a level that they do uh, really detailed uh, from policy issues through to uh, obscure legal points where the word uh, in consultation with and after consultation uh, with you know become uh, critical uh, and and this is what legal people uh, are able to bring to the table they they really have done, I think, a, a, an admiral job uh, on behalf of uh, industry and business, uh, and in fact, on behalf of the public, uh, in, in dealing with these issues, which are really complex issues. And, and, and the average person in the street and the average business and even big business is really not able to do this kind of work. Uh, so it really is, for me, gratifying uh, that the, is this level of work that is being done. And thank you, Jason, uh, for uh, sort of bringing all of this to our attention and, and for the work that you have been doing, you know, in this field. So thanks for that presentation. And uh, we're now going to move on to uh, our final presentation. Uh, and that is uh, a presentation uh, from Dr. Gerard van Harmelen of Enerweb. And to give you a bit of background, Gerard was a co-founder of Enerweb in 1999. And he's currently the Chief Innovation Officer, focusing on the trading and wheeling environment. He's been involved in the electricity industry for 25 years and in the trading environment since the introduction of ESCOM's internal multi-market model trading initiatives, as we've heard in the early 2000s. Enerweb has also been at the very forefront of energy trading in the Southern African region, having developed the first short-term energy market platform for the South African power pool in, 20, in 2002. And later, in partnership with Nordpool, um, Enerweb developed SAP's uh, Day Ahead market trading platform, which is currently still supported by Enerweb. Many of SAP's, uh, that is the South African Power Pool's utility participants, also rely on Enerweb technology solutions to manage their trading portfolios. And more recently, some international as well as local private traders are adopting the Enerweb trading platform. So Gerard is really very well qualified to talk to us today about the technology side 
uh, of energy trading and, uh, and of, of an electricity market. Uh, with that, over to you, uh, Gerard. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen? Is my screen sharing? Yes, everything is good. And, and the wick, sound is good, is good, too. Thank right. you. Let me go. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon again, everyone. Yeah, as um, uh, and, and thank you for the opportunity to talk this afternoon. I think as well as we've heard from the previous very, very well-established and qualified speakers, um, sort of guiding this route and this path that South Africa uh, is going on. We are more, uh, we haven't, haven't had the privilege to or we needed to be involved there. But in terms of implementing um, the existing solutions, uh, the, we're talking about markets and the traders themselves and that which is about, which is happening currently actually in South Africa and which is about to happen. Um, uh, I think Interweb has, has had some exposure. So we've been involved in sort of the software side, the providing of the solutions and the hosting and support and operations uh, of these markets since the early 2000s, uh, since the, the, the very first sort of establishments in the region where it was obviously the utilities, um, uh, the single buyers, the utilities, the traders in the utilities buying and selling with each other. But they are essentially two sides to the score, you know, two types of systems or, or that, that we are involved in and that we are supporting, you can see on the left hand side, and they are sort of the the, the, the market platforms, the, the, as Keith has explained and answered before, but, but Keith primarily, the, the, the sort of centralized platform where all this information goes and where the rules are implemented and essentially those those market prices are, are established. So we call that market trading platform. And then the, the, the participants on those markets and the, the systems that they themselves use, and we call those electronic trading systems. So we've been we've had quite a, a good run over the last since the 2000s, and you can see um, the red pins are where there are either production systems, anywhere production systems running in the Southern African power pool below, and East African power pool about to be that process is is uh, started now. The, the the training systems have been up, but the production system is is about to start, and then also up up in the, in the Gulf states on the top right. And so in terms of the market, the trading platforms anywhere you know, is is uh, providing and supporting and then the trader systems the participants traders themselves and we call those electronic trading systems and uh, although there's been some uptake in the region with uh, with the uh, utilities the last i think 18 months the last 12 months have been <laughs> been amazing actually in south africa so if you look at the bottom uh, i mean the, the this uh, down yeah we are uh, commercials done and we're essentially waiting final contract signing and press releases for three electronic trading platforms um, in in South Africa. In South Africa, so that's very very exciting for us that that, that these traders and they're not utilities now. <laughs> traders are embarking or two uh, two are, but um, embarking on this electronic trading platform side. So the the systems for the participants and then the the, the centres the, the 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 platforms in the middle. Um, in terms of just from the early days, the first systems that were commissioned from 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 Eskim as a trader then was with the the, the, the Eskim trader, and they were on on Excel up to that point. There was about five thousand megawatts running, and there was this collaborative pool running in the region called the short term energy market, and uh, the trader essentially had to move to off his Excel because, uh, you know, of the stream of the fairly heavy requirements, IT requirement or business requirements, which translate to IT that, that was needed now. So the metering data then, and even now, the interaction and the management of, of, of knowing what happened hour by hour, or half hour by half, and the versioning of that data, just because we collect the data in tranches and then it gets validated, et cetera, and modified, and it can get modi modified uh, several days, even weeks after the event. So the management of that versioning, the continual, uh, this is bilateral markets. These were bilateral markets, mind you, primarily with wheeling then already. Um, the continuous negotiation and updating of contracts and terms and pricing on these contracts. You know, you sign this long-term contract, but it's continuously being updated and things change. So the management of that versioning on, on you know, in Excel just became a, a nightmare and formal systems were required to do that. And then uh, I think even now we see this, the, you know, the expert traders, 
uh, the, making the deals were really the experts in these areas. But what happened is they also became or were the experts in, in converting those into formulas and then sort of got involved in the in the monthly operations. And this is very, very good for are very bad for for process maturity and business maturity, where you want that type of intellectual property and reliance on expert resources, you want that embedded in your system and in your process so that you don't have this reliance on these individ individuals. That's not, not good for a business, but also, you know, to free them to, to focus on the, sort of the front end of the business. And as we said, the meter data management was still, is, is still, is still a problem. From in the sort of the 2005s, that's when the first sort of market trading platform in the region started being addressed. At that point, uh, Nordpool Consulting was was driving or yeah you know, had the contract in the region uh, for the consulting, and they partnered with Enerweb as, as their IT partner. And the first system, then the first market trading platform, was this mix of Nordpool system and Enerweb system, Enerweb product at that time. Uh, and uh, at that time, the, as now, the transmission capacity was uh, that was available for for day ahead market between the countries was very constrained, and there was very limited market trading. You know, sort of real market volumes um, at 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 that point. Um, the, uh, the actual infrastructure, the actual market trading platform was hosted in, in Arari and internet wa connectivity was a problem. And this sort of internet connectivity problem, I think we sort of over that now, but that sort of became a, a, a driver or, or a sort of a, the, the cloud solutions were automatically sort of lent themselves, you know, or were needed, urgently needed in, the, in that regard, just because of the, of the connectivity. In 2010, um, the participants started maturing now and the market started maturing. There were these decisions required around, are you going to, how much bilateral, how much day ahead market? So in terms of decision support from the systems, this was, this was needed. A lot more participation, this scheduling thing that Keith spoke about, this balancing market, staying in balance, um, requiring notification to your counterparties. Or to the market, what you, what your generation, what your plan generation was, what your load was, became sort of a, a real pain, real overhead requiring to be managed automatically by electronic systems, and forecasting became critical uh, in order to know what 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 was going to happen in the next 24 hours, and that extended into being able to do your budgeting for year ahead and operational planning. You know, in the next two weeks, maybe something's happened to one of your generators and now you need to rerun your planning for the next sort of two weeks. So those requirements came to the fore uh, in terms of the traders or the participants and their systems. So because multiple participants were starting to use uh, or the participants we were exposed to and that were using Anaware product at the time, we, you know, it became very evident that provide that the participants in these markets more or less need the same type of system. Their processes are more or less the same. Integration is different. The business processes are slightly different. Financial system integration is different, but but so it lends itself very well, um, the, the energy trading systems to this uh, sort of base modular approach that gets configured specifically for a specific uh, solution or a specific instance. And so at that stage, this is like 15 years back, um, the Enerware products were pro productified and they started using this mono repo context as IT terms of about all your code is in one place and it uses sort of standard modules, standard code, standard technology stack. And so you get the benefit of, you know, of, of everybody's or, our, or the, the experience that, that's come up to now. New functionality gets rolled out to everybody in terms of deployment pipelines. And so sort of the IT maturity side in being able to have a product that sort of Kind of truly really becomes enterprise became, came to the fore, and there was good combinations at that time in terms of just this, the, the on-site and cloud uh, sort of combinations um, that that uh, the markets need. Um, in 2000 and um, 2015, 16 onwards, um, the new market, another version of the market trading platform, additional markets being added now. 
So not only the day in intraday, but now there were these physical forward markets. And recently, I think it was last year, the sort of balancing market got made available in SAP, in, in SAP specifically. And in, 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 over the last few years, then Anaweb has been important with British and Consulting. Thanks, Hans. It was, gave us a good talk this morning as our, earlier um, for this new market trading platform. And yeah, you know, key features coming ahead, coming to the fore now are not only for, again from the market platform side, but from the, the, the participant systems is having these configurable products. A product is like an hourly product. You can trade one hour or two, two hours or three hours, as well as these time of use buckets. I think the traders maybe, or currently in South Africa, this time of use bucket settlement all the peak hours for a month then are a product all the off peak hours all the standard hours and they can have their different they can have they can be traded as individual products both on the market and then on the, the trader systems themselves and there was this huge emphasis now over the last couple of years on sort of real t transactional integrity and stability of the solution and very, uh, you know, maturity of releasing changes into both to the traders and to the market platforms, you know, so that there's no risk, uh, you know, of uh, production systems being unavailable. So very heavy maturity on that on that side that came to the fore. Um, that leads us to where we sort of are the last um, 18 months, last year, where this bottom-up comp 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 competitive, I don't know if I'm allowed to call that, but this market transition is happening in, in South Africa. And we've seen now, you know, the, where we've been exposed and, and the traders that we are interacting with, you know, these aggregation type traders that uh, that have, you know, put, uh, put for a portfolio of generation and, um, uh, and a portfolio of large and small customers. And so, so the, I call that an aggregation type trader or retailer type trader where, you know, you're very heavily focused on the retail side where you're mixing um, your energy product with other products, um, insurance or whatever, and you re, you're actually retailing energy. Um, so we've seen that uh, very exciting stuff happening in South Africa uh, currently. Um, uh, as with the SAP traders of many years ago, we we, uh, we see spreadsheets uh, being used, you know, and uh, having some having some success. But um, uh, as as they as these traders have found out, and, and as we move, um, you know, these IT system requirements, uh, business requirements, which can get solved that way, are are very very strong. There's a lot of uh, I think you know you know all this. A lot of green targets as a driver for the sort of um, movements we see now in the, in our bilateral wheeling uh, space in, in South Africa, uh, future volume price security. And, you know, there, there, are, there are some very interesting things happening on the, on the profit motive driver side of things where, uh, you know, traders are trying to figure out how to, how to get this competitive advantage. Uh, from, the, from what we see on the IT side, metering is still, still a massive challenge. You know, Eskim is, uh, Eskim and, and there's a mix of Eskim metering involved and the municipal metering and private metering service providers. There's some really nice ones in South Africa. But but this stuff is happening via email, um, mostly, uh, and, and, and spreadsheet. The increasing, as we said, the counterparties uh, increasing is, is requiring a good look at systems. Um, interaction with S, once you are a trade, once you have a deal between a buyer and a seller, trader maybe in the middle, or then interaction with the utility billing systems is still manual. There's people involved sitting in front of desks, figuring, trying to figure it out and trying to modify those, those utility bills. Um, I think as a result of that, and just as, you know, from where we are uh, in terms of, this move into this multi-market model. Currently, we, we are experiencing significant interest, commercial interest in outsourced middle and back office operations, which means the traders, let me talk to the traders specifically now, you know, want to focus on the risk and the pricing and the contracting side. And this metering, settling, billing, scheduling stuff, uh, you know, the, the for that to be handled by a specialist uh, provider, you know, has got has got very good um, uh, interest. We see very good interest in in, in that. Um, 
It's a very quick slide. It's just it, basically it says you know the trading operations. We split them up on the left hand side to sort of uh, to front, middle, and back. All of deal making, the risk management, uh, and performance management, and then all the back office stuff. You know, and uh, we see there there's people, processes, and systems. And these systems are primary candidates. You can do this yourself, or get uh, do a custom development, or buy a solution. Uh, you know, and then uh, embed it into your business and have people operate that. Or you can even go the, the service, you know, the software as a service route here, or um, go for the outsourced, where you don't even outsource operations, where you don't even buy, you know, pay for a license, you pay for service delivery in terms of these types of functionality. So in the systems, there are good candidates here. I th in terms of people, I don't, you know, I think this is where core competency should sit with, with these types of traders. And in the processes, these, these processes can sort of um, interact with each other. Um, in in the local, I mean, I, you know, the first two two slides back, I was speaking about sort of transactional stuff, just getting the transact, just get the transactions and get the settlements to work at the, at the you know, at the end of the month. But the, the analytical world is extremely interesting and and is perceived as a, you know, big data and all this stuff is perceived as a, as a good source of, or place where everyone says, everyone says it's the, of competitive advantage. The wheeling contracts we've seen up to now, you know, bilaterals tend to be localized and relatively small, you know, a few, uh, one, a few, few deals that are having to be handled. But um, in talking, so analytics, not that heavy, except maybe on the allocation, but I'll speak, speak to that a bit. But in terms of the investment decisions that are being made now, um, there's some very nice uh, risk analytics types of models which are being utilized, we see, by participants now to make these big decisions and figure out their risks and um, uh, figure out how to structure their portfolio, specifically the generation portfolios, to manage this, th these variabilities, all types of variabilities, price variabilities, weather variabilities, customer falling in and out type of variability, you know, that type of um, variability. So this good Monte Carlo type of work uh, being made available. And as I said, this competitive advantage in this space on the right hand side, software as a service is uh, showing very good promise. Uh, we are, this is real, we, we have we're having experience, um, you know, and, and these back outsource services, but there are some concerns, the third point, you know, around IP and protection of competitive advantage. I mean, it is real, you know, that if you have um, specific uh, algorithms that you want that a trader would want to protect that, that algorithm. So there are specific infrastructures on that IT side that we can that we can make available or that others can make available to allow you to use the benefit of these enterprise systems, even as services, but still maintain uh, some of the trick stuff internal to yourself in, in terms of, you know, there's very good technologies on 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 the uh, machine uh, on the on the Python and the cloud sort of side that allow you to do this sort of productionizing sort of analytics is is where that that goes. Um, on uh, the point of this slide, primarily being the sort of the analytical side on the right hand side on the right hand side, the metering of yeah, we have these various options. Maybe I can, can look at it afterwards, and then inevitably sort of this type of data lands up in a database uh, which you can also use or purchase as a service with your transactional systems both the, both the market side the central center and the traders themselves lots of integration happening here but the analytics is is sort of a very very interesting space and inter in, it, it, it sort of pro progresses from left to right from relatively simple increasing complexity to the right very difficult to do these relatively simple to do these but the simple things, you know, have less value and the complicated things have a lot of value. So value on the vertical axis, complexity from left to right. And it f follows this progression, you know, what is happening? You need to know what is happening. You need to know why it's happening. And will it happen again in the future? Um, just generically. And then what can we do to influence our future? So the, those risk management, net present value type of uh, models sit over here. Yeah, optimizers you know these wheeling optimizers to decide what to wheel to who given in your portfolio to maximize penetration or profit uh, sit in this space so these are typical modules and products that uh, that are that become available i need to move on i see i'm just on 20 minutes so chris i'm seeing my time it's just i've got um i'm going to jump this slide but basically we've we see that maturity or sequence 
um, of the types of systems, whether they sell or, or bought, sort of follow a sequence like this. From in the in the beginning, you're just metering data, and you go through these steps more or less. You need to know what's happening on your supply and demand side. Um, you know, three, four, five, six. I'm just going to jump to the end. In the end, you know, you want software to help you if you're trading on a market and you have bilaterals and you have constraints and penalties to help you to make these bids and offers. Um, I think important here, whoops, is um, uh, what happened now? Okay, I'm just going to go back here. Um, the maturity and the level. The, or the velocity through these steps is driven by fr firstly you know how the market progresses you you know you're not going to have a trading assistant if there isn't a, a multi-market but it's also got a lot to do with number of counterparties you know the, the the more it sort of increases exponentially this thing you know the maturity of your organization do you have internal audit etc the life cycle that you as a business are in and you know whether you as the tra as a trader for instance now you know what is your comp do you want to how do you think about all this this requirement? Are you going to build it internally, or maybe whether you're going to outsource it? As a final slide, I I, I think I've broken. You know, we've sort of maybe almost the same, but it says from where we are now, time of use bucket settling of wheeling agreements, all the way to the right hand side on wholesale markets, intraday, and maybe even balancing market. Giving these competencies, you know, metering data access, settlements, scheduling, forecasting optimization of your trades and risk management you know maybe yeah most of the things are optional and you can you can wing it for a while but on this side in a couple of years time if you know the sort of enterprise level systems are are absolutely required and in some cases this is this is where the difference where the difference is i think i've that's it chris that's uh, i've got time that's the question so i think thanks chris just watch my time back to you <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <Can I? laughs> uh, really, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, some thoughts just as is the complexity of all of this and how satisfying it is to know that Gerard has been around since the beginning. And <laughs> this kind of institutional memory of understanding this evolution and, and developing as technology develops, as customer requirements develop, as markets develop, is absolutely critical and um and i have no doubt uh, i mean this it side of it uh you know is, is at the very core of one's ability uh, you know to be successful in the market to trade properly for traders to uh, have the right kind of platform so uh, well done on uh, being around uh, for the entire evolution of of this process and still hanging in there uh, like I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks so much for that. And it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dario Musso of Rand Merchant Bank, who's going to give you some uh, thoughts. So Dario is a chartered accountant and investment banking director at Rand Merchant Bank. He's got more than 20 years experience in power and infrastructure. And before this, he headed Rand Merchant Bank's infrastructure sector solutions team responsible for the bank's power and infrastructure financing and advisory services across the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, region. Dario has been responsible for leading several landmark project financing across Africa and Australia, spanning a conventional and renewable energy solutions, road toll concessions, power public-private partnerships. Uh, he's gained international project finance experience in Australia and at German investment bank West LB. And prior to that, he was also a member of the PwC Australia Project Finance Advisory Team. So he's going to give us some thoughts, you know, about the role of financial institutions in the development um, of market and in market reform in general. Uh, and, and also, um, you know, give us some of his own insights to what he's heard today. Uh, the, the presentations that we've had, which have covered everything from, uh, you know, from Anton's introduction uh, yeah, outlining some of the key issues and uh, questions that we we need to ask uh, through 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 to the uh, international experience, the local and ESKIM sort of perspective, uh, the legal perspective with focus on the electricity regulation amendment bill, uh, which is the the legal framework for the this uh, restructured uh, market reform, uh, and lastly to the technical side and software and IT side. Uh, that uh, Gerard has brought to the table. So, uh, Dario, um, over to you now uh, for your wrap-up and uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, and thanks for having me on the webinar. 
Um, I think firstly, I just wanted to um, just look back at what uh, each presenter has said and, and some of the key statements and points that stuck out for me uh, from uh, each presenter's uh, slot. Now, Prof Eberhardt um, opened up the, the webinar uh, with some opening remarks. And, and for me, the key things that, that jumped out um, from what he said was that we, you know, South Africa is really on the cusp of a fundamental change in the South African or in in the energy market, right? With with the um, promulgation of this new uh, electricity regulation uh, act um, and a move to a more open market. Um, the other thing that he said was that it effectively removes the the, the referee player role um, that Eskom would have and makes it uh, free and fair for everybody to participate in the market. Um, he also said that we have, uh, or the country has some important choices to make around how to structure the market and, and uh, effectively tailor it to best suit our conditions, um, learning from international experience who uh, we, we, uh, we have the benefit of other people's uh, school fees. Um, and then Hans Arold um, gave us a sense of the international experience. Um, and some of the key things that that uh, stood out for me was that these uh, th this reform and move towards uh, an open competitive market um, isn't a start stop operation. It's it's uh, it takes a long time and you need long term tweaks as you go to to the to the um, regulations and into the implementation. And that's certainly what markets are experiencing overseas. He also um, clarified um, that it really is all about balance. Ultimately, it's about balancing supply and demand at the most optimal um, economic outcome for all parties. Um, he did say that, uh, you know, creating a market like this is a combination of market thinking as well as technical thinking within the constraints uh, of, of the reality. And every market is, is different. Um, the other key point he made was that for this to be done properly, it really needs a market reform team. Um, it's the people that make the difference um, and we need the right people to drive this forward. Um, the Keith's presentation of what Eskom's doing was very interesting for me um, and all the work that's that's been done on the market uh, Operator, include, including dusting off very old uh, um, documents and ideas and strategies, um, as opposed to starting from scratch. Uh, and he took us through, you know, the roles of the TSO, um, uh, you know, what the market operator would do, will do, um, and the fact that, uh, you know, the, how the balancing mechanism uh, will work uh, or is is um, supposed to work in theory, um, and how bilaterals will become. The balance responsible parties and will be penalized if they um, don't deliver what they say they're going to deliver the day before. Um, he mentioned that the, the central purchasing authority, the CPA, will have three key roles essentially. One is, is the buyer for the legacy PPAs, so the REAP, the RMIPP, the, the ESIP, which is a battery storage program, and the PICAs. Um, that, um, essentially will be a smooth transition from ESCOM to um, the CPA, uh, presumably along with the government guarantees that are tied to those PPAs. Um, the second uh, uh, key responsibility of the CPA was, was really to manage the transition to an open market over time. Uh, and then finally, the third, the third important uh, uh, responsibility of the CPA will be the planning and the look ahead and, and to set future capacity requirements for the country. Um, he mentioned that the market is probably going to go live around April, 2025, um, but the transition will take um, something like five years uh, to get us to, to the end, end state. And then Jason uh, took us through the uh, Electricity Regulation Act, the proposed bill, uh, we took us through the timeline behind the bill, the fact that it's only 33% complete, will only become, it only be expected to become law in March 2025, so still some long lead times there, and will we'll have, it's full effect will only really happen uh, in 2030. 
it's just reflective of, of how long things take in this sector, how long it takes to secure permits, how long it takes to, to secure finance, how long it takes to build a plant, how long it takes to find customers. These things always take longer than you think. Um, then he took us through some key issues that are that in the Electricity Regulation uh, Act, which he he has collated on behalf of of, uh, of BUSA, of which RMB has been a, a participant, um, and uh, he always raised some issues on on definitions and 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 uh, and some other parts of the of the bill that need that need attention for this uh, market to perform uh, adequately. Um, and then finally, Gerard from, from Enerweb um, talked about the trading experience they've had and they've seen over time, uh, took us through the history of, of the trading, of the inter-utility trading from the SAP to the East African Power Pool, um, the teething issues that were, um, that were experienced, um, and how the evolution of that market has occurred to, uh, uh, to where we are now, um, and how it's matured to uh, a position where we've got standard modules and standard code uh, available to participants. Um, and he talked about configurable products like um, time of use packets. So, so we see that as this market matures, it gets more and more complex and complicated, and it gives rise to more products and services uh, available. Um, he mentioned that the current position is that we're in an aggregation model, not a trading model, and I agree with that. So, so all the traders that are emerging in, in, in the sector are really just aggregating power from IPPs and reselling that to customers by bulk breaking it effectively. Eventually, the traders will become true traders um, and, and, and trade in, in day ahead, um, half hourly ahead, week ahead markets like is done overseas. Um, he mentioned that metering does remain a challenge that needs to be addressed. Um, traders are still at the email and spreadsheet stage at the moment, and that will have uh, that manual intervention will have to be eliminated uh, soon as as the volume of transactions increases, uh, and automation um, is going to undoubtedly be required. Um, you talked about the analytics that that uh, traders and other participants are likely going to require around. Um, intelligence to help uh, optimize trading uh, and balancing and and uh, also leads to um, proprietary trading algorithms at, at the trader level um so that's really for me what in summary what stood out from from every what every speaker said now i guess from a banker's perspective um i'll give you some some insights and thoughts I'll, if you just allow me to share my screen um just some thoughts that that um I think uh, are relevant from a banker's perspective. I uh, assume you can see my screen. Uh, okay, good. So yeah, all good. Okay, so so some of the sort of uh, you know dealing dealing with different participants in this market. Some of the the uh, the issues that are coming out is that it's taking too long. Um, <laughs> you know, the the Eskimo bundling, the creation of a transmission system and market operator is definitely the right answer and the way to go particularly because we're in a space now where energy generation is becoming more and more democratized. In other words, you don't need big utilities to build multi-billion rand coal plants or gas plants or nuclear plants to be generators. We're in a space now where renewable energy technology has evolved to such a level um, that is much more accessible to private generators um, and is much more decentralized. And of course, more affordable than the conventional conventional thermal technologies. Um, I think what's key and governments realizing this more and more is that a partnership with the private sector is really the only solution to help the country get out of economic st stagnation. Um, and we're seeing some green shoots in, the, in that space and some uh, uh, reforms and market uh, deregulation allowing the entry of the private sector to use its, its resources, its capital, its balance sheet. Um, I mentioned earlier, we have the benefit of international experience and the school fees that others have learned. So we really need to select something that makes the most sense for South Africa. Um, again, we don't have the luxury of time um, and we need to m keep minimizing red tape. A lot's been done to minimize red tape already as, as, as um, Jason, Jason mentioned, but more needs to be done. Um, and, and it talks to some of the, the tweaks that Jason is, is proposing in the ERA. Um, so the ERA is generally a good document and it promotes market reform. 
but it needs clarification. Um, it 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 um, it needs to be in a position where it's clear to all participants, and it's clear to NOSA, and it's clear to everyone as to how it will be implemented, and shouldn't be left open to interpretation. It then will create more uncertainty and confidence for market participants. Um, going this going this open market route will definitely promote healthy competition. We're already seeing it on the bilateral basis in private power. Um, and of course, it offers more, more options for all, for, for all parties in the sector um, uh, in terms of products and services. Um, I think one of the important things that, that should definitely be considered is that in the open market framework is that it should really be struct structured to optimize the benefit extraction for the grid operator, right? Everybody's focused on buying and selling kilowatt hours and electricity, but there are other important services that private generators and batteries, et cetera, can provide, um, which are called ancillary services, so voltage control and, and all these sort of other um, reactive power, all these other services that are really, really useful to, to, to a system operator, not so much to a, a corporate off-taker. Um, and it would be a, really be a lost opportunity if if the market uh, doesn't cater or, or allow for the trading of those services as well. Um, I keep having to, to say this, that there's a wall of cash available for the sector from everyone, local, international, et cetera. And the financial sector is strongly encouraging a multi-market model. Finance is definitely not a hindrance. What is a hindrance is the speed of deregulation and the speed of permitting, speed of building projects, um, and the speed of, of, uh, uh, of alleviating grid constraints. Um, we're still very much in a situation where there's too much money and too little, too, too little, too few projects um, to bank. And the final point from our side is we're seeing more and more how decarbonization is becoming mission critical for the for financial institutions in particular. Everyone's now got, uh, or most, most financial institutions have now got decarbonization targets. And so that has meant a huge prioritization of resources and allocation of resource, sources to this um, decarbonization renewable energy sector. So um, thanks, Chris, and me. Uh, um, that's me in summary. Um, over, back to you. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for that, Dario. And I think your summary and uh, the points you make are really exceptional and um, and wrap it up very very nicely indeed. So thanks uh, so much for you and to Rand Merchant Bank for your support and involvement in in, in this uh, webinar. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're now over to the Q and A session, and uh, we've had a lot of questions, and I see that forty seven out of 60 questions have already been answered, uh, leaving 12 uh, as open questions. Uh, we've tried, our, our presenters have been a great help uh, in this regard. And if I may ask all our presenters to switch their cameras on and uh, prepare themselves uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you the lady who is going to uh, run this Q&A, uh, uh, moderate it, and that is Christine uh, Juta. Uh, she is from the Power Future Lab of the UCT Graduate School in Business, uh, who are co-hosts um, uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, Christine is a PhD candidate at the Power Futures Lab at UT UCT's Graduate School of Business. Her research focuses on the role of new business models and enabling technology for power sector reform in Africa, focusing on market design, system operation, and regulation. Christine has participated in the Open Africa Power and Enertrax Fellowships, which provided a holistic uh, overview of the electricity sector, enhancing the technical, regulatory, and business skills required to work towards the electrification of Africa. Uh, prior to joining the Power Futures Lab, uh, Christine was a research trainee at the Florence School of Regulation, uh, where she engaged with distinguished scholars, it was part of the team that established the FSR Global Regulatory Hub in New Delhi, India. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you here uh, helping me today <laughs> uh, on this um, uh, Q&A session and in the, the webinar in general. Um, and I'd like to now hand over to you. Um, I will sort of be in the background. Uh, there is a set of uh, 
questions, uh, which you can see, open questions. We are well over time, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to press on because this is an important topic. Uh, and uh, we're going to allow half an hour of Q&A uh, for Christine to moderate before we wrap up. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you again to the panelists and presenters for your interesting submissions Or oh, since we started the webinar. I think we can see from the Q&A that we have had a very engaged audience who have been keeping our panelists quite busy. And as Chris mentioned, some of the questions have already been addressed, and thank you to the panelists for jumping in there in the Q&A session. So what I've done throughout the webinar is just put together some of the questions, and I'll pose these questions to our panelists, and then... After the first round, perhaps we can also open up the floor to invite some of the audience if people would be interested in opening up their mics and making a verbal intervention, if time permits, and then we can close with um, some uh, last minute uh, inter in interjections from the from the panelists. So uh, I think one of the emerging themes which has been common in most of the questions that the panel, uh, the audience has posed is that um, in line with what the speaker said that yes of course this is an ongoing process and it will take time there is need to continue making emphasis and placing emphasis on the clarif and clarifying the objectives if you could just um really highlight um what are, why are we doing this what why, why is this uh, why is this happening now i think the submissions by uh, anton in the beginning highlighted that this has been an ongoing discussion for a very long time why is the unbundling of escom seemingly taking off now uh, perhaps keith yeah um thanks christine so i think the big thing is that it we we tried this once before and uh, of the, the the slide I wanted to project and talk about was kind of the the various attempts that have been tried at liberalization over the last 25 years and I mean the, the white paper from 1998 the energy white paper really specified then what the, the the plan was and that was the first wave and then it kind of collapsed and then there was the ISMO bill back in uh, 2011 2012 and then that collapsed so this is really the third time at that But I think right now, I mean, at the time when we tried this in 2003, the kind of the pushback was always that, you know, nothing's wrong. You know, um, the system is perfect. Um, we don't need uh, to reform. Eskim supplying uh, fine. You know, we have excess capacity. We don't need to reform. Now that people we're talking about like the crisis, it's like, oh, no, it's a terrible time to implement changes because we're in a crisis. I mean, you can't have it either way or both ways. You know, either you implement in a crisis, you implement where everything's fine. But at the moment, it's kind of the, the, the driving force is really the fact. And, and there's a fantastic paper on um, how why markets uh, have developed over the last uh, 30 years, um, which I'd have to dig out for you. But one, one of the key things it talks about, like what key factors, one of them is the utility becomes a burden on the state. The second is electricity um, theft is a, is a, is a regular uh, issue because the prices are too high. And yet the utility is still not recovering its money. Um, so it becomes um, unviable. Um, and at the same time, you have decarbonization and then technology change. So all of these things have come together and maybe each one can be dealt with by the utility. It can recover and be able to move forward. But all of them at the same time, along with the technology change, I think basically means that the current uh, mode is unsustainable. Um, so that's why the, the change is required right now. Thank you, Keith. And I think this uh, feeds well into what Hans shared around the experiences of the uh, international uh, community or the global trends in uh, the evolution of power markets worldwide. He gave a very excellent presentation that highlighted some of the um, results so far in those regions. Perhaps, Hans, if you could just elaborate on the pitfalls that these countries have faced in their journey and what lessons could South Africa learn from these experiences? Yeah, but yeah, thank you for that. And I, I think kind of you learn from your failures, not from your successes. That's kind of the <laughs> the basics for 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 all of this. And I, I would maybe like to also then link it back to 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 what was said by Keith now, but also by 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 the previous speaker is that first of all, kind of humans are change adverse. Kind of, we don't we don't want to change. So you actually you need the crisis to change. <laughs> I think all uh, power market reforms have been initiated by some kind of crisis or failure. Uh, so, so, so in that sense, you you need you need some, something to to kick this off. And I, 
maybe relating back to also my presentation, I, I put a, a slide on Turkey, which is uh, um, uh, didn't spend a lot of time on this, but this is actually a fantastic experience. Uh, because again, it's a similar setup, not the same, but a similar setup. Turkey, kind of back in, in early 2000, were facing kind of a demand growth of 10, 15, 20% per year. They are the youngest population in Europe. And the, their uh, national incumbent saw that we cannot kind of finance the development that we need to meet this. Uh, and we see that kind of we'll end up in a load shedding situation very soon. But what they did with this strategy paper and having a very clear ambition on where they wanted to do and were able to prove that we are on this uh, path to develop this. Investors came. There was a line uh, uh, almost at the airport in, 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 in Turkey of international and national investors coming to that market because they saw that there was a good political uh, backing for the, the reform. Uh, people saw that uh, uh, what they tried to implement is something that we've seen before. We can understand this and thereby we are willing to come and invest. So again, following back to, to the presentation, the finance is there, right? The money is there. Uh, uh, I know that I speak for a lot of people on the call that we know that, that investors are here. Uh, the, uh, we are approached, a lot of us, from, from, from investors from all over the place that wants to come here. But they need to see the future, or at least the view of the future. And I think this feeds all the way back to what, uh, what uh, Anton said in, in his uh, opening remarks, that we need to show what, uh, or, or a strategy. We cannot say that, oh, this is a problem. We do the duct tape solution. We fix that problem, and then we see what happens. And then something else happens and they fix that problem. There needs to be some kind of longer term thinking behind this. And I think this is, this is crucial from, from uh, what we have seen in, 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 in the, the, the market reforms that have been successful uh, around the world. Thank you very much for that. And speaking of the long term view and long term strategy, we did hear from um, Jason, on the provisions of the new bill, uh, which is being tabled, uh, you highlighted some contentious issues. Uh, perhaps could you flag potential challenges in this implementation and perhaps what we could think about as solutions to sort of um, avoid those pitfalls in, in implementation of this, uh, of this bill? That's uh, quite a difficult question. Uh, I, I think perhaps uh, Keith might be a person more attuned to the difficulties in implementation. I, I found Keith's presentation really uh, very insightful in terms of precisely how the transmission system operator is going to work in all of its four functions. Um, and I, I suppose that uh, that that he's living those those issues as this as this transition happens. So those those would be the the nuts and bolts uh, of actually running the transmission system operator as that entity. I think one of the questions that springs to mind that. Um, Brian Day asked in the questions earlier was, what happens with the National Transmission Company South Africa, the NTCSA, which is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of ESCOM? It is going to do the job of the TSO until this trans transition period of five years is, is done. What happens then? The Act doesn't really say. Uh, is, is that entity going to transfer all its assets and business across to the transmission system operator as a distinct entity? Or is that entity, the NTCSA, going to be spun out and have a new shareholder um but it's effectively be the same thing that that's not entirely clear so that's one of the implementation questions that i think uh, loomed large in our preparation of our comments to the dmre um one of, one of the other interesting aspects of just from a legal perspective was um when, when we were commenting we were looking at the interface between the department of public enterprises and the department of mineral resources and energy when it came to the unbundling of eskom and how the legislation around the TSO actually um, uh, impacts on, on the running of this new market. And what we were told by, by government was actually, um, it, it's all in this, in this bill. Uh, but I think there does need to be a high level of communication between these different government ministries. So uh, I, I see that as uh, something that's going to be a real sine qua non of, of getting this off the ground properly. 
uh, proper intergovernmental uh, dialogue. Um, and then uh, finally, I think just making this this transition, there, there's so many lessons learned. I, I really found uh, Hans uh, Errol's uh, presentations from his experiences around the world um, uh, insightful in terms of the, the various pitfalls we, we'll encounter. So that sort of experience, I think we're going to need to tap as we go along as South Africa on this journey of liberalizing our market and creating this, this multi-market um, environment. It, it'll be great to in, envision a, a time when we as South African consumers, whether individuals or businesses, are able to choose uh, our electricity supplier off a menu of providers, a menu of prices, uh, sufficient supply, submission, uh, sufficient transmission uh, capacity to bring the supply to us. Uh, that that'll be a that'll be a really great outcome of all of this. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know, Keith, if you'd like to respond to that. Yeah, I think the the one thing, the the biggest risk, and it had, was raised in some of the the questions, is is really what happens on the distribution side, on the the retail side of the equation. Um, you know, we. The, the the ERA amendment bill really focuses on supply side. It's kind of very driven around reform around the supply side. And I think for a very re good real reason, because, you know, reform in the distribution sector, it's going to be a lot longer because of this, all these, the constitutional mandates, et cetera, et cetera, which kind of have a serious risk. But what, what does it mean then for municipalities to participate in the market? Um, and uh, one of the important things we didn't really talk about is that the market operator almost by default it's, it's a kind of a standard around the world that you set up prudential requirements of some form and that people participating in the market need to be able to come with guarantees or sufficient uh kind of backing from banks or whatever or even cash up front to be able to participate in the market so to reduce the risk on the market operator and the market as a whole to ensure settlements takes place uh, on a regular basis and we know, you know, at the moment, most municipalities can't pay yesterday's bill, let alone next week's. So it becomes a problem. So how do you facilitate that process? So they can also be in the market, um, either through some sort of special uh, trader that operates on their behalf uh, with government backing, whatever the mechanism is on place. Those are the things that we kind of have to spend time on. Um, but it shouldn't stop us from being able to have a market with you know, a large number of large power users and and others in the market, but you do have to deal with the reality that you know the bulk of the supply um, isn't really there yet to participate, and we need to manage that process. Thank you for that. I'm going to move over to uh, Harad. You gave a presentation that really illustrated this uh, in a evolution of uh, uh, trading platforms. Okay, uh, question for you there is just maybe if you could highlight what um, what are the technological innovations which have really made this possible, and also what is what uh, what potential cyber threats could uh, could could be a, an issue, and is, are there any any measures to just curb people's concerns or fears around that? Yeah. I okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. I think the great great interventions that we've seen over the past is definitely the cloud sort of world where beforehand you needed very specialist infrastructure and people to operate that infrastructure and DBAs and now you can just purchase you can just pay for this month to month service you know on fairly sophisticated sort of software services so that's been a, that's been a huge benefit i think to participants etc the i mean the ai thing has happened in the last year or so but before that machine learning was around a lot it's just got this new lease on life now so uh, machine learning these forecasting algorithms that can teach themselves i think that's that type of tool and the types of environments that are now available to essentially give you very serious capability fairly easily as a service that's also become fairly available. You know, you can buy these services. You don't need to employ a team of data scientists, you know, to do this type of stuff. I think that's making fairly advanced sort of trading algorithms, et cetera, in that space available. I think that's not as much yet, but it's going to have a huge, huge impact in, in the future. On the cyber side, just to address the threat thing, 
um, you know, for every trick we figure out to stop somebody uh, trying something, you know, trying to stop a service or steal data, you know, guys come up with come up with another another way to sort of circumnavigate that. So there's this continuing, ongoing white hat, black hat. Uh, underground war <laughs> it's like very very interesting space to get in, in in involved in i think in in some of just our experience just from some of the systems and for instance eskim's demand response systems that have that we've had the privilege to support for them for the last 10 years we haven't had not one half hour of downtime ever so we you know people employ you employ people and services to counter the attacks you know, so and we've been you know, the experience has been very good for us thus far. But recently, I mean, the reality also is recently in the last few months, the the type of activity to gain access to data that you shouldn't have access to, or, or has increased, and and so uh, efforts on that side and on our side to counter this is ongoing. So you, the, I don't think it's easy answer. I'm just saying experience has shown that it's fairly good, but you have to invest and you have to get the right people and the right tools, uh, automatic, automatic sort of um, detection tools and things to to stop the sort of cyber threat side of things. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's it. No, thank you for that. Uh, uh, and then Dario, um, you did highlight uh, from the financial perspective, what are some of the, the, your key takeaways? And I saw an, an interesting point there, which was very positive, that there's a lot of money waiting. Um, if you could just elaborate on what is the role of the financial sector in in the in this in this transition process? Is it that uh, you guys will become a player when everything has been sorted out and uh, putting the money where it's supposed to go, or do you have a role to play in the setting up in, of the of, of the market? Thanks. So, um, you know, I think that the immediate need is to provide capital and banking services to the sector to help it to facilitate its growth. Right. So, funding projects is obviously the obvious one, which banks have been doing since the beginning of REAP and continue to do in the private power space. And there's no shortage of capital there yet. Uh, and it's still very, very competitive. Um, you know, other products that, that are going to become more and more important are going to be things like bank guarantees, um, particularly for traders and aggregators who will need to post security with um, generators um, to secure, uh, you know, long-term bilateral con uh, contracts. So, so Coming up with with clever and interesting structures around um, optimizing bank guarantees for traders is going to is going to be an important role that banks will play. Look, in future, banks may um, enter into a, a trading. Will become traders themselves. I don't know. Um, you know, banks sell a variety of services. They have a huge customer base. It may make sense to 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 do trading as well. Um, and uh, you know, banks have a have a sophisticated uh, markets team who does commodities trading. And so there are some complementary skill sets there. But I think the immediate need is really to provide capital um, to in, in various forms to the sector to help it develop and grow. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question, I'll just pose it to the floor and uh, one of you can can jump in. Uh, I know it has been mentioned that the focus of the of the bill is more on the supply side, but I think a key concern for consumers is what risks they might face uh, and what might change from the consumer perspective in the short term and also perhaps in the long term. I know we've seen in other regions, um, in times of crisis specifically, um, the need for government intervention or, or someone to step in to protect consumers when things go wrong. Um, is there any thinking around that at this stage or are we not there yet? Uh, yes, Jason? Christine, um, one of the questions that I, um, that I responded to online had to do with uh competition law and remember that uh the electricity regulation amendment bill can't be seen in isolation it has to be seen in the context of all of our laws in south africa so if uh, a particular player becomes a dominant player or if a particular player is exponentially increasing its prices there are existing measures in south african law to hold those sorts of players to account uh, the the competitive forces of a market ought to put downward pressure on prices to the benefit of of all South Africans. 
Um, and in particular, the competition framework uh, is a, a very important protection for consumers in that in that area in particular. Okay, thank you. I saw Keith, you had a hand and then Hans, you can also come in after. Yeah, I think that is also one of the, the areas that the market code would be dealing with when it comes to, firstly, market surveillance. So it's quite an important uh, aspect of the sort of market that there is a market surveillance unit that kind of monitors behavior in the market and a market surveillance panel, uh, which, which is kind of appointed by the regulator to uh, deal with uh, any kind of uh, infringement on the, the market code and, and market rules, but also to try and deal with events. You know, so for example, as you've seen in Australia, where there's a crisis on the system, not sufficient capacity, and then they actually suspend the market rules. You know, that kind of uh, stuff gets put into the market code so that everyone's aware of what happens under certain conditions and what would trigger such an event. Um, and that really is part of the process. And when you put the market rules together, they can deal with all of these uh, aspects. Now, I know some of the the, the notes and the, the questions were kind of asking about things that had to go into the act. I think a lot of the time we have to be careful not to put things in an act and legislation which means that you can't change it easily. It takes years to change the legislation, whereas the code can provide for various uh, activities which everyone agrees is the right approach and maybe more uh, easily changed um, rather than trying to um, lock us into something in the act. Um, but I think this would be one of those areas where we deal with events on the system um, and the right of the system operator slash market operator slash nurse, whoever we uh, allow us adjudicate to do that that they can declare an event and, and suspend the rules. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hans, you had a hand up? Five minutes. Yeah, but yeah, but, but, but again, following up on this, I think this is one of the clear, uh, uh, let's say, experiences from, 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 from international markets is that established this from the start. So, so again, looking back at, at our market, kind of, we established this along the way when we got into problems looking back at uh, at our Norwegian market. Uh, so so this is one of the clear things that uh, that you can learn from 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 uh, international experiences that get market monitor and market uh, surveillance in place from the outset, have a clear authority and, and, and a rule set uh, that governs this so that you can you can tackle this from day one not trying to sort it out after we have an event when somebody is doing something so i think this is this is some of the key things that plays into the to the experiences that you can learn from others thank you uh, i'm just trying to scan through some of the questions we've received uh we're seeing in the chat here perhaps another question uh for the panel is what uh, what um what is the role of renewables in all of this? Uh, and uh, will the dispatch rules be technology neutral? Um, yeah. Yeah, I can answer. I think ideally the dispatch rules are technology neutral. It's more about uh, the capability of the market. Obviously there's always those constraints that I mentioned earlier. So certain generators would not be able to have the same freedom as others in terms of responding to price uh, changes. But I think really importantly, when we talk about uh, carbon uh, carbon emissions, carbon credits, the rules around climate change really should apply through the pricing of the product, which then comes into the market. So, for example, a carbon tax establishes what uh, the, the higher price was required to uh, burn carbon or uh, coal that then comes into the price rather than trying to establish it in the rules to deal with those things. You do it through other mechanisms that then internalize the externality. Um, and I think that provides a lot of the incentive for that. I think we also have to be really aware that right now, you know, renewable energy from wind PV is the cheapest form of energy. That should be kind of your driver actually in a future market that you're gonna get lots of energy coming from uh, those providers. I think the important thing is to bear in mind is that renewable energy also has a marginal cost of zero just about. So they would not be price setters in a lot of the times, particularly if you know, you're bidding effectively according to the, the rules of short run marginal cost. So price setting would be done by other generators. Um, and it becomes very interesting when you have surplus, you know, certain hours where you're going to have lots of PV and wind, and then the prices go to zero or, or potentially even negative. Um, and how your rules deal with those environments to choose which ones aren't in the market and which ones are. Um, but yeah, I, I think ideally 
you avoid doing um, kind of uh, technology specific uh, rules, but to try and accommodate different technologies and, and deal with the, the benefits and, and risks associated with each of them. Uh, Chris, I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm not sure if uh, it would be it would be interesting if we could have uh, the opportunity for one or two uh, interventions from the audience. If somebody would like to ask a question or make a comment verbally, if you could just raise your hand and then I can permit you to speak um, before we hear the final remarks from our panelists. Okay, I see a hand up. Um... Okay, I've allowed uh, Donald uh, to talk. Uh, Donald. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for the enlightened uh, presentation. Donald from DPE. Uh, I'm coming in. I had one comment around the coordination, especially on the era between the two departments. We, we, we spent quite a significant time going through era together with uh, DMRE, we do have a, a platform that we, we engage, we discuss uh, the unbundling, the, we, we call it the restructuring of ESCOM, where we share ideas because there are some policy indications. And as you know, us as a holder, we, we, we don't set policy. So it's a very interesting comment that there are some gaps, especially around that what will happen to transmission uh, post the finalization of the era. Uh, it, it, it's some of the discussions that, yes, I, I strongly believe that we need to have just to close uh, at the loopholes. It, it was a very a, a tough process, and I think it was a learning curve for most of us Hence, uh, some of these gaps and, and, and platforms like this are very important just to assist us with regards to uh, advising on things that we, we, we didn't look at in order to improve the process. But I can assure you that this is work in progress. Uh, it, it doesn't stop there. Uh, the five years which was given for transitional arrangement, it provides us with an opportunity to really look at this, review this, as you're aware that one of uh, the requirements by this proposed uh, amendment is that uh, the transmission must be established by the minister. So we are working closely together with uh, the DMI to see uh, how this is going to be established forward and how the transitional arrangements are going to be uh, incorporated into the NTCSA to make sure that we start the training. And it, it, it's a milestone that we thought that we're not going to reach, but slowly but surely we're in there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your input, uh, Donald. Uh, we also have another hand from Art van der Meer. Um... Okay, I've allowed Art to talk. Please, Art, go ahead. Can you switch on your camera, uh, your your um, uh, uh, microphone? Right. But, uh, thank you, thank you, Chris, uh, colleagues. Uh, perhaps it is it is to you, Keith. My question: You have mentioned that indeed uh, we do not think that this would be a mandatory uh, centralized pool for a kickoff. Uh, specifically taking into mind that quite a large portion of the municipalities will most probably not be able to play in a market due to the financial and also some technical difficulties. So if we do start up a market in March 2025, and we know that a significant portion of our off-takers, some 60% of our total customer base sitting out there, two-thirds of them probably is not viable at this point in time. And, owns ESCOM with 65 billion, as you put it, uh, can't even pay yesterday's account. How how do you do about tomorrow's account? How will you get 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 going with that portion of a market? Because as 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 Jason also explained, uh, our era bill is not is not giving some hints how we will go about in sorting that out. So surely one would need to have some special CPA or you will have some 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 state guarantee support coming in 
uh, defining within the market rules that yes you may play but under these circumstances or you will not play if you can't meet certain conditions and for a certain period of time uh, you will be out of a market till you can prove yourself to be let's call it market ready or so on but how do we start it really if a big portion of our off takers are not ready coming March 2024. Thank you, Art. Yeah. Keith, would you like to respond? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, as I mentioned, it is one of the biggest risks uh, in the entire process. Is to my mind the the most logical. It's the same as what you know governments did around the world when there was the banking crisis, uh, 2008 nine is that you kind of create almost, and I hate to use the phrase, the bad bank, but it's kind of the, the mechanism where you put your risks into a special trader. And yeah, as you mentioned, it could be a central CPA, but uh, or a special CPA, again, it becomes at risk of using that phrase a little bit too often, but because the central purchasing agency has a specific role. But yes, let's call it a special trader that is uh, sort of backed up by government uh, so that those municipalities are able to be in the market through the trader so the trader is operating on their behalf the alternative is that they remain with distribution but obviously eskim distribution then uh, you know has to deal with the, the continuation of the risk and the non-payment which is not a viable long-term solution either so i think the idea then is that establishing some sort of special trader or a mechanism where at least you know the market operator is protected so that people can participate in the market there has to be some way to ensure the funding is always there in order to um, facilitate the payment to the generators so yeah it's it is one of the the important ones i don't have an answer for you i think that's one of the things to look at in terms of you know why we develop the market code but i do think that it's centralizing it you know, take i think one of the biggest issues has been that this municipal debt has been a long-standing issue. It's not a current issue. It's been going on for a long time and the can just constantly gets kicked down the road. Now with these reforms, you basically, it can't be kicked down the road anymore. Something actually has to be done. The National Treasury has a plan. It's now about how can we try and facilitate that as best possible to ensure that uh, these municipalities can be in the market or at least operate via someone in the market. Thank you, Keith. And uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give us uh, in a minute, uh, if possible, your final words around this topic and way forward uh, in a nutshell. Um, so starting with uh, Herad. Yeah, thank you. It's been uh, thank you for the privilege to having having chatted and um, uh, having the audience there. I think final comment, I think we have a very exciting time ahead. I think we as one of the providers in this space are really looking forward to to very exciting times, at least from the IT side. I think the financial trading side is also exciting, but it's not for us at the moment. So that'll be great. Thanks. Thank you for your contribution. Dario, one minute for your final words. Yeah, um, I think Gerard uh, said exactly what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much an exciting time for the South African electricity market. Um, fundamental changes happening and about to happen. And uh, I think everyone has a part to play, including the finance sector, who is um, heavily involved in, in current activities and uh, remains ready to um, help uh, transition to an open market. Thank you, Dario. Hans, your final words? Yes. So first of all, a fantastic uh, seminar and a lot of good presentations and a lot of uh, questions to the point that has come in the in, in the chat. So my summary is, uh, first of all, try not to be perfect, but build flexibility into the processes when you're moving forward. Because again, if you look at the power sector now, who can predict what that, that will look like in five years time? I for sure cannot do it. And, and just as an example, in Norway, we did the last legal unbundling between DSO and retail in 2021, almost 30 years after our market reform. So again, back to my summary, do the Martin Luther King thing, move forward, do as uh, SAPP said when they, when they uh, uh, open their market. If you want to jump into the pool, you need to get wet. So again, jump into the pool, maybe on the children's side, so you don't drown. Uh, uh, and then again, uh, uh, I saw that somebody said, uh, uh, what is the issue or what is the pitfalls with the multi-market model? I think it don't take two big steps. Align like we are saying all in Africa, how do you eat an elephant? It's piece by piece. So don't try to swallow it whole. 
Thank you for that, Hans. Uh, Jason, your parting remarks. Uh, just that I've been feeling extremely patriotic all week because of the Springboks in the, the World Cup. Hope they win on Saturday. Um, makes me think of, of uh, being part of the Pika project and then REAP back in uh, 2010 when that kicked off. That evolution all the way to August 2021 where um, the gates opened for private power projects in South Africa. This is a continuation of an evolution that I think is going to unlock a lot of good for a lot of South Africans. And uh, so in, in that whole patriotic theme, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this will lead to some very, very positive outcomes for all of us uh, in South Africa. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Keith, your final remarks. Okay, thanks, Christina. I think, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, we're seeing the evolution of the market. We're seeing the market is actually already happening. You know, as we, as Jason was identifying, there's a lot of trade taking place, new contracts being established, and it's all good because you know it avoids load shedding. It helps us uh, combat the the crisis. But we still have you know it's like the wild west. You've got everyone doing their own thing through town, and, and you kind of need the sheriff. And the idea is that these the centralized markets, the kind of the, the rules that we want to put in place is like bringing out the sheriff to try and keep everyone in order and make sure that there's some sort of rationality behind the market. So it's not as if we're trying to introduce a market, the market's there. It's about trying to make sure that the, the market works for the benefit of everyone. I mean, I think that's an important thing to bear in mind and not, as Hans says, not trying to let the perfect undo the, the, the good. You know, we just need to go with what we can and then we can work over time to try and develop the perfect model if such a thing exists. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. And with that, I'll hand back to Chris uh, to wrap us off. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that I thought this was a wonderful uh, set of presenters we had. Uh, we, we got the best that we could put together. Uh, as one of our presenters uh, said, I think it was Hans uh, Errold, uh, you know, this team, it's a people business. And if we can put the right people in charge of this or, or to lead the way um, on, on this market reform, uh, I think the kind of people we've got around the table uh, would go a long way. Um, of course, there are others too. Uh, but we've got a fantastic set of presenters and I want to thank them most sincerely uh, for the hard work that they put in and the time they 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 put in, I also want to thank the Power Futures Lab at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business and Anton Eberhard for really motivating me and firing me up to uh, organize this uh, webinar and for partnering with us uh, in in so doing. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you, of course, to Christine uh, Juta from the, the the Power Futures Lab, who I think has handled the Q and A so extremely competently uh, and, and free of stress. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you uh, uh, with us today, uh, Christine, uh, helping on this. Uh, and I, th I think uh, uh, you, you've just done an exceptional job. So I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Grand Merchant Bank, uh, Weber Wenzel, Enerweb, the South African Independent Power Producers Association, uh, Get Transform, uh, and the South African German Energy Program and GIZ for their most valued support in putting this webinar together and for the great work that they do in this field on an ongoing basis. Uh, with that, uh, thanks to the audience, uh, you will receive our report back uh, probably tomorrow morning um, uh, with links to view the, uh, the, the audio visual recording as well as download all the presentations. These will also go out publicly. And uh, I think this is one step on the way um, we try to make a difference and to uh, solve problems in the electricity supply industry, uh, you know, at various levels, uh, you know, from maintenance level through to uh, market structure level. And, and, and this is uh, one of such initiatives. Thank you, everybody. And uh, may I say, I wish you a, a wonderful afternoon and everything of the best.